Call this meeting to call this meeting to order at seven o'clock. Pledge of allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. We'll do the fire evacuation announcement. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the case of a fire, there are two ways to exit this chambers. Uh, to my left, through the council doors. Uh, turn left, please, and go down the flight of stairs and out the back. Or, of course, right behind you here at the exit of the door to rear the chambers. And, of course, if there's any kind of emergency, please walk away from as far as the building as possible. Thank you. Would the secretary please call the roll? Uh, yes. Uh, Louis Fiore? Here. Virginia Higley? Here. Linda DeGray? Here. John Petronella is here. Francis Salimo? Here. <clears throat> Kiran Majmudar? Here. Uh, Kenneth Holinsky? Here. Vinnie Grillo? Here. Christian D'Antonio? Here. And Nicholas Lefakis? Here. Thank you. Let the record show that we have a full committee here tonight, the commission, and the alternates, unfortunately, will not be seated tonight unless there's someone needs to recuse themselves. So we have all, all the full-time members here. Make a motion for the approval of the minutes of the special meeting on Thursday, March 3rd. So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Higley. Is there a second? Second. Connected by Commissioner Alimo. Is there any discussion on those minutes? Any additions or changes? All those in favor of accepting those minutes, please raise your hand. Aye. 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 Let the record show that seven people uh, approved them. Uh, abstaining were Commissioner DeGray, Halinski, and Lefakis from those minutes. I'll take a motion to approve the minutes of March 10th, our regular meeting. So moved. Moved. moved by Commissioner DeGray. Is there a second? Second. Second, second by Commissioner Higley. Any discussion? Uh, I have one. Go ahead. I have one item. Uh, there is a, I would appreciate if we could table these minutes. There is a section missing that I feel is very pertinent, and that was on the uh, paper road release. And <clears throat> because of the applicants, I really do believe that that needs to be in our minutes, and that is unfortunately missing from the paper part of the minutes. Is there any other discussion on those minutes? Mm -hmm. I would appreciate a motion to table those minutes and have that section added and then bring back to us the next meeting, please. Motion to table. Motion made by Commissioner Alimo to table, seconded by Commissioner Higley. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, staff? Okay, thank you. I didn't want to just try to amend those. I'd rather have the section put back in or put in. Any zoning enforcement report tonight? Not a, for, not a formal one, but uh, next week or the next meeting, you'll get a uh, spreadsheet with the w ones for the past couple of months and uh, take care of it that way. If something may come up tonight, but other than that, nothing. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Any, any questions for Rick while he's the report? I don't know Thank you. Happened. I think we'll all look forward to that next month. Thank you. Move on to the public participation. <clears throat> At this point in the meeting, the Planning and Zoning Commission welcomes comments, concerns, and opinions related to planning and zoning in Enfield from anyone who is present, provided that no one may discuss any matter of business at this time that is already elsewhere on the agenda, any matter that is part of an open public hearing of the commission, or any matter where a decision of the commission may be pending. And I do want to mention also that the Bacon 2535 is pending litigation, so you cannot comment on that also. So having said that, if there's any public participation, Please come on up and identify yourself for the record, please. Angela Foss, 16 Crescent Beach Drive. Um, <clears throat> I asked you a few questions at the last meeting, commissioners. They were, so these are questions I asked. They were question number one, why are you voting yes on site plans? for buildings that do not, you do not know who the tenants will be. Question number two, why would you vote yes on a site plan for the building at 113 North Maple Street? On the site plan, it clearly denoted that Agrimark would be one of the tenants. And then I read you a portion of the JI article where it clearly stated that Agrimark is a distributor of dairy products and therefore falls under the I-1 zone of needing a special permit to build. And then I referred to the Enfield Zoning Regulations, page 56, section 
six dot, I'm sorry, two zero, stating that this clearly falls into the use agricultural products, manufacturing and storage under the I-1 district, which requires a special permit. Question number three, how do you proceed to move that building from a site plan to a special permit? I'm skipping question number four. Question number five. I then asked what steps she would follow to do such a thing, moving something from a special permit, I mean moving something from a site plan to a special permit. Question number six, what happens when a tenant does not fall under a mere site plan review? I went on to state that I do not know who is instructing you to vote yes on a site plan, but only, but you need to ask the right questions. Your first question should be who the tenants will be. Without knowledge of a tenant, you cannot merely allow a site plan. I did also watch the plan of conservation and development with Donald Poland at the meeting on March 16th, and I am very hopeful. First, the mention of raising awareness of wetlands areas and striving to enhance, protect, and restore them. At about 40 minutes in, he talked about a site plan and that, that when you weren't required to um, just have a hearing, you did. I again want to tell you that I am very thankful that you did understand and that you did actually listen to your residents. But again, you, um, trying to, I'm trying to get rid of what you, <laughs> you know what I have in here. Um, but it was a case of a special permit according to the regulations. So then he mentioned all the same quotes we hear over and over again. Bound by the regulations. Doesn't change the site plan approval process. If it complies with the regulations, it must be approved. The huge issue here is that you do not know if a building a complies with the regulations because you do not know how the buildings will be used. Then the discussion made a turn for the good. Lori Witten mentioned that we should probably require a special permit for buildings over a certain size. Yeah. Mr. Poland stated that there are uses to deserve special permits. And then he said, just traffic alone should deserve a special permit, require, should require a special permit. I wanna let you know that I did go home and listen to the remainder of la the last meeting and did not get any answers to the questions that I had asked. I will do the same tonight and I'm looking for answers. How do residents get answers for our questions? <laughs> do I need to submit my questions in writing? I will tonight. I have left you with both my email and my phone number. Can you please contact me? This is very frustrating. It's a situation that all of us residents at Enfield on all the different meetings at all the different board levels are confused about. We speak and we receive no answers. It's an unproductive conversation with questions being presented and receiving no answers. It's time for you to not only listen to our questions, but it's time for answers. It's time to get new plans for both buildings from Wynn Stanley that include a special permit. Thank you. And I have my phone number and my email address. I'm going to leave this packet with you, which also has for you an example of a special permit amendment site plan review from another town. Thank, Thank you. you. Is, it, is there anyone else for communications tonight? Is there anyone else? For the, th for the third time, is there anyone else? Seeing none, public participation is closed. We'll now move on to uh, new public hearings with the secretary read the legal notice or the notice. Open hearing PH 3027. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> The Enfield Planning and Zoning Commission will hold public hearings at the regular meeting of Thursday, March 24th, 2022 at 7 p.m. 
in the Town Hall Council Chambers, 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, concerning the following application. Public hearing number 3027, 2 Washington Avenue, special use permit application to allow for one commercial vehicle, IV Nairota Broderick, owner, Richard Broderick, applicant, MAP 22, lot 59, TD2 zone. Thank you. Will the applicant or the representative please come forward? <clears throat> I can you make sure the mic is on and just identify yourself for the record, please. Uh, my, na my name is Rich Broderick. And you might want to pull the mic a little closer to you if you can. Yeah. Great. My name is Rich Broderick. And I, I'm a little confused here. I may have the, applied the wrong thing. According to my reading of it, of this piece of property, we're allowed one commercial vehicle to park there and apply for a special permit for the second one. Is that correct? That's the way? No. No? Okay. Then we, then this is correct. We are asking for, uh, to be allowed to park a 250 pickup truck that has commercial plates on it. Anything else you want to add to the to the record? There's uh, two other trucks that are parked there. They are both pickup trucks. One's a 250. One's a one uh, 150 Ford. Uh, both are regular plates. They are not commercial plates. One truck is mine. One truck is my son's. It's a do. It's a two family residence, and there's some other cars that are parked there. There's one parking space for all the residents of the house. <clears throat> any commissioners have any questions for the applicant on this? Commissioner Higley? I just have two um, things I'd like to discuss. Um, it's my understanding that the vehicles have out-of-state plates, Massachusetts plates? Correct. So they should be housed in Massachusetts, I would think. Some of them are. Some of them we drive back, back and forth to work. We live. But if you live in Connecticut, your vehicles should be registered in Connecticut. Connecticut. And also, um, I noticed that uh, one of the qualifications for the one commercial vehicle is you have to park it 10 feet away from the uh, property line. And I drove by there and it did not appear. I saw three vehicles and it did not appear that your um, vehicles were parked 10 feet away from the property line. I assume that the little. Uh, trees are the property line there's a fence uh, a mesh fence which is the owner of the property next door right. that's the property line and then there's a regular f new fence that we put in right. so you would have to move the one over to the other are side. we allowed to park a regular car there pardon me are we allowed to park a regular car and not the commercial vehicle yes okay mm -hmm. so if we just move the yes. two that would be okay okay because okay that's it for now. Any any questions? And please, the alternates can also contribute here. So don't you know? Any other questions, Commissioner Petronella? Yeah, I have a question regarding this uh, sketch of a site plan that was submitted. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it shows, and it says parking for commercial truck. And the location as to where it shows would be from P Street if you're facing the garage to the left of it, which is is within that uh, side yard of, of 10 feet right. is is that what you're proposing no you know was when all the pictures were taken and this was all brought up we were in the middle of, of redoing the backyard redoing the roof which we have a building permit for uh we put a garden in the back we put a cistern system on the roof to capture water for the garden and that whole side of the garage has been all redone resurfaced and if we can't park a car there we won't park it mm -hmm. right now the trucks are to the edge of the garage and there's nothing between that and the fence it's all been graded the closest vehicle to the fence is the neighbor he parks his truck right up against the fence always has okay so, so if you if we don't 
are not allowed to park the commercial vehicle there, we won't. You're, you're looking to comply with, with the 10-foot uh, yeah, exactly. side don't. yard. Because, I mean, right now, uh, when I went by there, I think there's a snowplow parked there, and then there's a truck parked uh, probably with, um, outside of the 10 feet. But, uh, um, and, uh, and as I understand it, there's one pickup there that is owned by a personal, your son, I think. I own one, and my son owns one, and they're both not right. commercial plates. Okay, and so, and you're looking for one commercial Correct, the 250 that's there. there with the plow. Okay. That you saw on the corner, closest to the fence. All right. If it has and, to be moved, uh, we'll move it. Yeah, and, and, and as I understand it right now, um, there, there. It appears that you're running the business out of there, whereas uh, I guess you're having employees go to work there. They park their personal vehicles on the street, then they get in their in your trucks, and then they go out, and then they come back, and they and, and so forth. Is is that is that the way I understand how no. it's happening now? No, there's there's not. A, we have a business. It's a snowplow business. Mm -hmm. The people you saw there working now have been working on the house, redoing uh, okay. the garage, grading. We built a garden, we built a uh, hen house. Um, all that grading next to the, where you saw the plow, that's all been leveled off. That's a chicken okay. coop now. Um, they're just friends helping okay. they, that we were not paying. Understood. Do some of them work for us? Yes, mm -hmm. but they park their trucks there because they came there because they're but, working on uh, you're working on the property well, working on the property we put new okay. storm windows in and, and whatnot we've been working on the property for a few years mm -hmm. the business most of the trailers and uh the our workers that don't take our trucks home uh, is at the cube smart next to the dmv that's okay. where your trailers and the rest of our equipment is mm -hmm. that's where the business is run out of okay so in another Two weeks, everything will be done, the garden will be planted, and everything will be cleaned up. All right, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Commissioner Vegas? Yes. Um, I, I noticed the bobcat type of equipment there. Is, is that permanently there, or is no. that just for the, the, the backyard? It's the chicken work? coop that we uh, were building. We were building on the side and got a complaint that it was too close, so it was used to pick up and move it around the back of the garage so it's 10 feet away and not seen from the road and that's what's been grading and uh moving the equipment around i noticed some vehicles were parked on the street um that looked like construction vehicles with a snow plow and another one with um what looks like a fuel tank uh, a pump type fuel tank in the back where are those typically housed the one with the fuel tank is the black 250 that is not a commercial vehicle. That's my son's. Uh, the uh, I, my pickup does have a, a plow on it. Right now it doesn't, um, but it has that option. We have plows on both, and we take them on and off. Well, I noticed one on the street that had a, a tank in the back of the, the pickup truck, and it, it looked like it was it's a, a fuel, it's a fuel tank. Truck. Yeah, it yeah. is a fuel tank for on the black truck is for diesel. And a few of our trucks are, are diesel. And that's what that was for. Thank you. And right now it's very valuable. <laughs> I think s staff would like to come in at this point. Any other, qu any other questions can wait? Did yeah. Staff wanted to indicate something? I, I have one question oh, oh. that maybe staff can help me with or, or Mr. Broderick. Um, the application is for the, the one commercial truck. The 250. But you, but you did state you had two other trucks that would be parked there. Yes, as property. far as I know, you're allowed to have a, a pickup truck in part in your yeah, driveway. Yeah, those are not designated as commercial trucks? They're not commercial trucks, no. I have the registrations right here. Okay, okay. So they're combination trucks? No, there's no combination in where we set up the regular business. There's no combination plates. Okay. So you either have a regular plate, or what they call a red plate, or you have a commercial plate. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Okay, so I no. So, those are so they're not used for the business at all? Uh, occasionally, they, they are, if we're hired to do it, yes. Okay. Then, then I would have some question about how we classify a commercial truck versus a non-commercial truck. That's right. I mean, Absolutely. Right. That, that's, that's my question. I'm, I'm not sure if staff can help me with this, or but it's, it, it seems like 
Yeah, you, there's the possibility you, all three of them are used in your business, and you, you would end up having basically three commercial trucks parked on your property. I no, we have three drivers parked on it that live there that go to work. That's not how we look at it. No. Well, I understand, but, but the regulations— Same as anybody, a lot of other businesses, uh, snowplow drivers especially— Take their trucks home, and so they, they don't want to drive a, a regular car. Oh, I, I understand the reason for doing yeah. it. It's just that the town yeah. has regulations that state you can have, you can apply for a special permit to have one commercial vehicle on your property. Right, you, you and the drivers it. that we have that are those trucks are issued 1099s. They're independent contractors. Okay, but they're still being commercially used. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, Mr. Chair. Okay. I have a question uh, re okay, regarding that: are, are those two vehicles registered under your uh, personal or business? Personal. Personal. So they're personal vehicles. One, yeah, the one that we applied for is under the business. That's a commercial right. truck. Right, but the other two are registered. Registered personal. personal. So, so they're personal vehicles. They're not yes, commercial they are. vehicles. Okay. And when we you. use them, we we're, yep. we get a 1099 for what we're paid. Yep. Okay. Staff. Okay, so I'll try to add a little clarity to this. Uh, under the regulations, uh, commercial, and the regulations deal with Connecticut plates. So commercial or combination, if it's used in the uh, uh, process of, of the business, it's considered a commercial vehicle under the regulations. So even if it has a personal registration, um, it's still used in the course of business, and many of them, the majority of them, if not all of them, have B and L management uh, labeled on the side of the trucks. All the trucks are registered in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, they're not registered as a business in Massachusetts, other than uh, the business address being either a, an address at Op Apple Blossom Lane in Westfield, Mass., or prior to that, it was out of a condominium complex in Hopkinton, Mass. Uh, there was no businesses there. That's just where they have to list with the state of Massachusetts. The business is not listed any place in the state of Connecticut. They're all Massachusetts plates. Um, they're conducting the business, or it would appear that they're conducting the business out of uh, the location at 2 Washington Avenue. This has been going on since November. Um, they have been doing work over at the yard, but on a constant basis, there's up to six vehicles, commercial vehicles, under the regulations parked at the address. Um, and as for the application, if you look at the section of the regulations for commercial vehicles, there's a number of issues with it. Uh, 33013, for instance, uh, only one commercial vehicle is allowed on a property for an approval through this commission. Um, Section B, uh, subsection 6, the vehicles are commonly parked on the grass and landscaped areas. Uh, there was a picture, should be a picture in your packet there that shows that. Uh, that's not allowed under the regulations. Um, they were also doing work, repair work on at least one of the vehicles at one given time that it happened to go by and uh, repair work could not be allowed under the regulations at the address. Uh, there's no screening, or at least under the regulations, the vehicle, commercial vehicle, would have to be screened. Uh, and it doesn't appear from where he wants to park it or any place on that uh, driveway that it, that vehicle could be screened in any way from the neighbors. Also, it poses, where he has it on the uh, diagram, it poses an obstruction to pedestrian and uh, vehicular traffic for the driveway just to the west. Um, so if that individual was pulling out or, or backing out of that driveway, it would be obstructing pedestrian traffic and vehicular traffic in that area. And uh, so there's a number of issues with the, the approval under the regulations itself uh, for any commercial vehicle to be parked there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the report. Thank you very much. Is there any other questions for now? I have a question. <clears throat> Mr. Alamo. I'm looking at one of the photos here. Um, looks like your sand truck. 
I see on a door B and L. I can't make out what it says underneath. Sand truck is the commercial truck, correct. Okay, so that has B and L on it. Right. And I think I've seen another truck with B and L on it. But the plow has B and L on it, or is that the same truck? No, that's a different truck. So I'm looking at the pictures in front of me here, and um, the one with the V plow. The V plow is the 250. Yeah, and I see B and L. What does B and L mean? B and L management is the LLC out of Massachusetts. Okay, which so the addresses. So there's two vehicles in this um, report that have B and L, which would be a commercial vehicle, right? It may have been one of the other trucks parked during, there during the day, but they're not. They're, there's not two B and L trucks that are parked at night. Well, I see. Again, I see the B and L sand truck, right? Correct. Called it, and then I see B and L. Another whole, another truck that actually right. is a different truck mm -hmm. that has the logo on it again, because the one with the sand truck is a is a different body, different cab. Correct. So again, in these pictures, I'm seeing two vehicles with a logo on it, B and L, which right. looks like a commercial vehicle. So now we have two commercial vehicles. We have ten. Be honest with you, we have two two there. We have ten commercial vehicles. As I said, we're not running a business out of there. That's where we live. Most of them are at the Cube Smart. Um, I'm just trying to, I'm not trying to hide anything. I'm just trying to find out. No, what I'm just trying to be clear because I'm yeah. here in one vehicle. Now I see two. Right. So my eyes aren't lying to um, me. So I just, that's why I just the, want to be clear. I, I'd like to bring up uh, the picture of the vehicle on the lawn is the neighbor's vehicle. They're not ours. And it was after a snowstorm when we were banned from parking on the street. He asked if they could park there. We said yes. So you're, so one, I'm one, sorry, go ahead. Continue. So I'm when sorry. some of the pictures are taken, it's, it's during the day. And uh, uh, we're not allowed to have anybody at the house that has a commercial vehicle. I, I just want to understand the rules. Right. So if you have 10 trucks, so they're not there. No, right. But essentially, these trucks can be rotating in and out all Correct. day, all night, 24 hours, because you own the business, you live there, your employees are coming in and out. So there's really no way to tell what you're doing, I guess. I'm a little confused. But what, what I'm sa saying is well, a different person may be there with one of the different trucks at a time. Right. He does not live there. Or, right. or well, how do we know, how do, <clears throat> as a board or as staff, how do we understand what you're asking? When we're, when I'm just trying to not be fined and to know what, what I'm allowed to do and not so to do. So I see a letter from a code enforcement officer that says, Playing Zone Commission has received a complaint regarding. Who, what's the complaint? Well, who, so obviously there's a complaint filed by a neighbor or somebody in the neighborhood um, that's obviously upset about this. So we have to be sensitive to. The people that are complaining. So I don't think you'd be here tonight if somebody didn't file a complaint. So I think the activity you're doing raised to the level of a complaint being filed with the office. So again, I just a little confused, and maybe staff can we'll, say. Look, we'll keep going on if you don't mind. We'll just no, we'll keep moving on. Go ahead. Yeah, yep. I'm, so I'm, I'm good. I'm just, are you? Is there any? Because um, we do have another opportunity for some more questions. Um, is there anyone here in the public that would like to speak for or against this application? Is there anyone in the public who'd like to speak for or against this application? Uh, for the third and last time, is there anybody in the public? Apparently not, so we're going to continue on. Is there, I want to give the opportunity if anyone in the public wanted to speak. So go ahead, applicant, you can respond to anything else. Yeah, I, um, I live with my daughter-in-law. Am I not allowed to, to park my truck there and live there anymore? Because I, I well, well. First of all, they're registered in Massachusetts, and if you live here, you need to get those registered in Connecticut. That's a different issue. That's not us. But I'm just passing that on to you. <laughs> That's a I violation. Have a, in I itself. have a home in in Mass, and but I'm living here right now. Okay. Well, again, that's a we'll, we'll let the okay. we'll let the other, uh, proper authorities take care of that. But I'm just passing that on to you. If you live in where you know the law basically is is the old pillow law. So if you're living here, you, and if you're living here for whatever the time is, you need to get those vehicles registered in Connecticut. That's not really our issue. I'm just passing that on okay. to you. But that is something that's been notified in our documentation here. Um, so change all the plates to Connecticut, and it would be all right. 
No, no, that, you, you, you wouldn't be in violation for that because you might be hearing from somebody else on that. That's not us. I don't know if I'm explaining myself correctly. I'm just passing on some information for you to use. Commissioner Grillo. Thank you, sir. I, I, just one question. Um, you said that you're not running the business out of that house, correct? No. May I ask where you're running the business out of? Cube Smart. Excuse me? The Cube Smart. You're running your business out of Cube Smart. Yeah. Is there phones there? Is that business registered here in Connecticut with the state of Connecticut? No. Okay, so you're. Oh, this isn't we're, good. Okay. We're an LLC out of Mass doing business in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Okay. And if I'm if I'm wrong, then I'll. But if you're running just just future, but if you're running a business out of Connecticut, you need a Connecticut registration. Not only that, you need to be registered in the town of Enfield that you have a business here. If you have your business at the Cube Smart, that's in Enfield, Connecticut, correct? Yeah. Okay, you should be registered as a business. Even though we just I'm parked just there and worked at all these different places? Sir, so it's a, con a container place. And you're running a snowplow business out of there. I, there's really not much more I can say about okay. that. I think staff uh, wanted to add some more. If, you, if you're all done, Commissioner Grillo, thank you. Staff. Well, just uh, Cube Smart is not approved to have business offices in any way. Right. If I may, where, where do you get phone calls for your business? I have the phones. Uh, and where do you keep where do you keep your records? Most of it's on a phone. Okay. Well, <laughs> Cube Smart on George Washington Road is not approved for the right. for a business uh, right. it's use. Storage. It's just strictly storage. You can store vehicles there. It's Everybody really stores stuff. different items there. This and that. The business is not being operated out of the two addresses up in Massachusetts. As, you, as a matter of fact, you told me yourself, it's your son's ex-wife at the Apple Blossom, right. and Hopkinton was uh, three years ago, and all that is is just a. Uh, a registration with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It, it has nothing to do with the business trust being operated out of those two locations. So in all intents and purposes, you're operating out of the house or on your phone when you carry it into your house, one or the other. But you can't operate out of CubeSmart. So obviously, you're operating out of the house. The well, so it, as I said, it's on the phone. Is there any other uh, questions for the commission? <clears throat> I, I, I have one uh, question for staff. Uh, Rick, is is a, uh, um, a a person who has a company vehicle, that company vehicle registered to a company is considered a commercial vehicle, correct? By what we're talking about right now. That is correct. So there's about, I don't know, several thousand violations in town that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. There probably are. And, yeah. and I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, for instance, uh, the trades typically, you know, they have uh, take home company vehicles, a pickup, if you will, uh, could be a van. Uh, there are salesmen who drive company sales cars and so forth. So, so what you're saying is all of those are considered commercial vehicles that are uh, in violation. If they have commercial combination plates on or they're used in the um, activity, and, and this activity is pretty obvious because there's snow plows on. It's property management. The trucks are labeled as a property management, B&L management. So it's, it's, there may be. And for me to go out and do a 1,000 vehicles for people who take their uh, work vehicle home, for instance, a sedan or something of that sort, because he's a businessman and he has a, a car, it, it, unless it comes to light, and I can prove it, but I mean, in this case here, it's kind of obvious with the pictures. If, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Well, I, I'm just trying to put clarity as to what, what, the, what the regulations call for, because is, is in, in all fairness, uh, you know, uh, somebody who, a salesman who drives a company car is, is, is violating the ordinance because it's a, it's a commercial vehicle. That's what you're saying. What? That Impala sedan is a company vehicle because it's registered to a company. If it's used in the it's, it's course be, it's, of It's a business. salesman's car. It's being used for business. That's why he's got it. So I'm just trying to put clarity as to what we're doing over here uh, because 
Um, it, it's 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 just it, it involves so many. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm in a construction business. We all know that. I, I give you know vehicles to, to several of my employees who take them home and so forth. Some of them live in town. Some of them don't live in town. So. Uh, just, just trying to understand exactly, exactly what it is that uh, it, it, it impacts. I, I understand where you're coming from, and you're probably correct that there are a lot out there. But this is just yeah. one of those cases that's a little more blatant than others with yeah. the vehicles. I mean, it stands out like a sore uh, thumb there. Understood. Are, are we here to act on whether he can park one commercial vehicle, or are we, are we talking about running the business out of that Washington Road? No, we're acting on whether or not he can park one commercial vehicle. Yeah. So there's a lot of background in that. that I, comes and I know play. we're talking about running a business out of there, too, and I understand it. So I just want to make sure that we're going to vote on one specific thing, which is the commercial it's, vehicle. It's strictly th uh, Section 33013, and I explained okay. some of the requirements for that. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Thank you. I have a question of staff. Um, we're here tonight to address one commercial vehicle. But as you said, it's very clear that a business is being run out of there. But we're not here to address the business, and the business probably would not be something that is allowed. So it's kind of a catch-22 type thing, correct? That's correct. It's similar to the situation that took place on Brainerd Road when the commission, not necessarily everybody here, but you, you approved the Two wreckers right. uh, for an address up there, but right. actually under the regulations, you could only allow one commercial vehicle, uh, not two. But after that was approved for the two commercial vehicles, they continued the business of bringing in vehicles, and the, and the business itself was registered out of that address. And I had to go further with some other activity to quell the issue of the business being operated for, out of there. And under the regulations, this type of business is not allowed in a residential zone, but that's part of the reason why the initial co complaint came in, that a business was being run from 2 Washington Avenue. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right, can we move on at, to move on? Um, question been exhausted. Uh, mm -hmm. Make a motion to close this public hearing, if that's agreeable uh, to everyone here. So so make, moved. Motion made by Commissioner Higley to close this public hearing. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner DeGray. All those in favor? Aye. The public hearing has been closed. The unanimous seven nothing. Um, I think we need a, to move forward logistically. We need a motion to approve, and then further discussion on that. Is there a motion to approve this application? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to approve uh, public hearing number three zero two seven in accordance with the uh, resolution prepared by staff dated 324-22 with the uh, attached uh, 26 conditions. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner DeGray. Now, again, for those new, new commissioners, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to vote affirmative on this. It means this is the process we go through to get to the vote. Discussion. So we're going to have some discussion. I just wanted to get that comment in so if people aren't misunderstood. We need a motion to approve to continue on with this process. So again, open for discussion, and, and Commissioner DeGray. Um, seeing that Mr. Broderick is a little confused about what his role is as, as far as getting a license in the state of Connecticut, and I know there's a lot of things that he's not clear on. And we're only here for this one thing, but there's this whole complaint about running a business in, out of that that home. I feel uncomfortable moving forward until Mr. Broderick is clear on what he needs to do in order to come into compliance. He doesn't seem to me as being clear as what he needs to do. So um, I would, that's my personal opinion. Anyone else have a? Yes, I have a. Have a. Sure. Um, I guess my understanding is is that if we vote to approve uh, this particular motion, that you will only be, only be allowed to park one commercial vehicle mm -hmm. on that property. Mm -hmm. The other two vehicles, I, I think, can't be parked there because they're commercially used as part of the business and they're combination plates. Okay, that's my opinion. In Connecticut. So, so in Connecticut. 
Again, this is Connecticut, not Massachusetts. Okay. Our regulations are very clear. You can have one commercial vehicle. That's it. You can have your own pickup truck there. If I... And so on. But you can't park the other vehicle... My personal... Use. That personal truck could be there as long as I don't work for the company. And don't as work for the company. As long as that truck is not used for the company. Correct. Excuse Please. me, the public hearing's been closed. Oh, so the applicant... You, oh, I there's no, no back questions with the applicant. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. He, the applicant's done. Uh, okay. He can sit there. Okay, That's I'm it. sorry. That's okay. Yeah. You can ask staff that question, Ms. Commissioner Helensky. Okay, so it's my understanding that the two other trucks, we, we approve this, only one truck is allowed. So you can't park the other two trucks because we think they're commercial trucks. Um, I believe staff. unless there's true verification that it is not used as a commercial vehicle. I mean, if you have that truck... If, and, and I don't know the answer to this, and maybe Rick does. Does the personal vehicle have the BL logo on it? Uh, there's so many trucks there, I can't answer that. There's there's probably four or five that have been there that have the BL logo on it, at least that have been parked there. So it's I don't know if he has it or not. I'm sure he can say whether or not he has the BL logo on it. So... Okay. Mr. Chair, uh, yes. Mr. Sure. I was trying wait, to get wait, to wait, before. Wait, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, what you said? I thought he was done. I'm yeah. sorry. Are you all set? Wait. Go ahead. No, that's what I was getting to before. It's like a revolving door of trucks. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, and it's obviously a 24 7 business because you're doing snow plowing, you're on call. So, how do we ever, well, say, well, say we improve one, how do we enforce it? Or how, I mean, uh, maybe to Rick. Uh, it could be 10 trucks there at noontime. So, maybe you make lunch for everybody. Everybody comes in for lunch and you cook. And there's eight trucks there, and they're gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, I mean, it's just as, this is a very confusing uh, yep. application. I don't know. We, I know we can understand and approve one truck, but how does that get enforced, I guess? Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I, I, I tend to agree that it's put an, an extra burden on town staff with all the other things going on. Don't forget, we only have one zoning enforcement officer. So, you know, pretty, again, we're putting an undue burden. Uh, just my opinion on this, and, and, and this is like this is just too much of a revolving door. There's too many ifs here that it's just it's not a fit. But I think staff wanted to say something else well, here. I, I, you know, unfortunately, you closed the public hearing. Yeah. And it sounds like you still have questions. Yeah. Well, we're so. No, so but no, I think we're just chatting among ourselves. We maybe okay. we will. Well, okay. Yes. Let's let's All see right. if we can sort this out. And is there any other questions? Or, Commissioner DeGray mentioned that she would like to kind of like table this item, it sounds like. I, I'm not sure where but Commissioner Lamb was going. You, you can't close the public. You, could, tab you, you, could, you right. could table action, but you, right. uh, unless you rescind what the, the closing of the public hearing right now, which is still not exactly proper, but if you, or, you know, you know, spoke too fast and you would like to get more questions, you could rescind your pu the you can rescind the motion for to close the public hearing. I mean, as long as it's done right now. Yeah. No. But that's up to you. But otherwise, you can table the action, and you can. The thing is, is you can't. You could. You could get clarification from staff, but we can't submit any more documentation. Sure. Yep. Understood. I'm prepared to go forward. Yeah. I, I, did, I just have one more comment. So. Yeah. On its face. The application qualifies for one vehicle. No, not necessarily. One. That's what he's applying for. One commercial vehicle. On the face, of, he, he's here for one vehicle, so it, 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 it meets the regulation. So we're going to deny him no. because of the uncertainty of everything else that's going on. I mean, you have, we have to give a reason for denial. Yeah. Right. But it says here in uh, section, where is it? Wait a minute. 3.30.13. B, V, I, I, small V, I, I. It says commercial vehicles shall be owned or operated by the permanent resident of the property. And they're all registered in Massachusetts. He lives at 2 Washington Avenue. The registration of the vehicle is not 2 Washington Avenue. And it's not 10 feet away from the property line. And you have to get rid of all the other ones. So it sounds like the horses. The cart's in front of the horse oh. here. It, it doesn't say anything about state and where it's registered. It says that it has to be owned by the person at that residence. You're right. 
You're right. So, but and, and they could theoretically park the car, the truck, the commercial vehicle, ten more, you know, one space away from the edge, just for clarification. I stand corrected. Thank you. I know where you're going, though. <laughs> so again, I back to what I'm saying. On its face, he's here for one commercial vehicle. We, well, the, we're not the enforcement agency. We're here to, we, right? But we're not. We're, what's it's the, the the burdens on us to whether deny or to approve this application. And the gentleman's here for one commercial vehicle, and one commercial vehicle is allowed. You can approve if it satisfies the regulations under thirteen thirty point one three. If it satisfies all those requirements then you can approve it. If it doesn't satisfy those requirements, then there's an issue. And, and that's what you violated him on, that, that's, that section, right? No, his application, it, can the vehicle be screened? No. no. Okay. That's one of the things that you have to, you have to determine. Can it be screened? It, well, yeah, so it has to be a 10 feet away from the property line. Can it be screened? Uh, does it interfere with other traffic, pedestrian or... Uh, or otherwise on the, in, the, in, in the neighborhood. Uh, so there's sections there that I read out and that are included in the packet there that can either deny the application or approve the application, but it's based on the regulations. It's not just one commercial vehicle and say, okay, you can have one commercial vehicle. There's requirements to go along with it too. It has and, to be and, under, and under your violation, he's uh, violating some of the regulations. Well, right now he's in violation because he's not, it's not approved. Right. And he can't keep commercial vehicles on a residential zone without an approval from this board. So if we approve it, does he meet all the other parts of the regulation? Well, that's up to you, really up to this board to determine, right. not, right. not me. I'm well, saying I, I the regulations are there for you to look at and make a determination on the application before you. Are we done with comments? Yeah. Are we done with comments, everyone? Is there a vote, a roll call vote? Um, Again, yes would be to approve this application, and no with reasons would be to deny. Mr. Secretary, roll call vote, please. Okay. Uh, Lou Fiore? Uh, against, because I don't believe this application meets all the requirements of section, I believe I have this right, 3-30-13-E. Okay. Linda DeGray? Uh, no. Uh, again, for the same reasons, it does not meet all the requirements in 3.30.13. Uh, Virginia Higley? Against, uh, just as they said, it doesn't meet all the criteria for Section 3.30.13. Francis Salimo? Um, I'm going to vote for it. I feel uncomfortable voting against it because of um, the lack of information I have in front of me. Um, once there's one truck there, um, I'm not sure that uh, he wouldn't comply with one commercial vehicle. One. Kiran Majmudar? Against because we're not sure if he can, the applicant can comply with all the regulations, and they have not so far. Uh, Ken Holinsky? Um, I'm against. Um, I believe it violates the uh, paragraph 3.30.13 commercial vehicle rules. And John Petronella votes for. So let the record show it was five, five against two. and two against. Sorry, sir. Four. Four. Two, four, and five against. Yeah. 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 Four, five, yeah. two. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. We'll go on to the next. Secretary, please read the application for PH 3029, please. Go ahead, John. Take it to me. Yeah, no. Go ahead. It's all right. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Town of Enfield Planning and Zoning Commission will hold public hearing at the regular meeting on Thursday, March 24th, 2022 at 7 p.m. in the Town Hall Council Chambers at 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, concerning the following applications. Public hearing number 3029, 90 Elm Street. Special use permit application for outdoor home and product show 
Enfield Square Realty LLC plus Enfield CH LLC plus Enfield Mason LLC owner. NCCCC applicant map 43, plot 16, BR zone. Hey, would the applicant or the representative come forward? Hey, good evening. Good evening. I hope the mic is still on. If you could check that, I appreciate it. The red light should be lit. Thank you. Can we just identify yourself for the record, yourselves for the record, please? Go ahead. My name is Ame Betcher. I'm with the North Central Connecticut Chamber of Commerce. Gary Cody, and I'm also representing the North Central Connecticut Chamber of Commerce. Hey, thank you. Can we can just uh, briefly describe the application for tonight? Well, we're coming up on our 54th annual Home and Product Show, and this year, Ame has taken over as chairperson, and I'm stepping down, and she had a great idea to have an outside venue. So that was a first for us. So we went through the process. And we will be having, if it's all approved, uh, some dog rescue companies coming, some automobiles, campers, so on and so forth, and we're going to have a great show. And anything you'd like to add? or um, Just that there will be a couple of pop-up tents, no bigger than 10 by 10. Um, additional vendors haven't really come forward. Uh, two food trucks also. Thank you. And any questions from the commission? Any any questions, Commissioner DeGray? I um, kind of looked at the forecast. Saturday's kind of nice. Sunday, not so nice. What happens if it rains? <laughs> Are they coming inside? Tell me out. That's we, have per, we have provisions for those companies that have product outside. They have a booth in, inside should the weather be faulty because they're going to want to talk to some people. Okay, great. I mean, product show's always been good, so thank you. Looking around for the only thing I noticed from the staff report was um, you did uh, have approval from the health department. You've gone through all the, the health and fire and um, police department. I, I believe the police department did their own thing, looked around. Yeah. Um, yeah. The food vendors that we have outside have their own catering license, and they're dealing with the health department on their own. Yeah. Okay. adoption yep yep okay any other questions is there no oh, is there anyone here in the audience who would like to speak for or against this application is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak for or against this application staff uh, have anything they'd like to add no I don't believe so dog scar dog star rescue is a great rescue group I do a lot of uh, dog rescue so Go, go adopt a dog. <laughs> is there any more questions from staff on this? I, think, I take it this is this weekend. Yes. Yes. Yeah, last week, yes. yes. So we can't table this one. <laughs> you got till tomorrow night. Yeah. yeah. Um, Just so you know, the the, the 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 show is also inside. Yes. So yeah. okay. Just yeah. for the general public. Just so you know, you're all welcome. Yeah. Thank you for for free. Yeah. Actually, I'll, I'll be down working one of the booths, so I'll be seeing you. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess I'll ask for a motion uh, to close this public hearing. So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Gray, seconded by Commissioner Majumdar to close the public hearing. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And I guess I'll take a motion to approve. Motion made by Commissioner Helinski to approve this application. Yes. Seconded by Commissioner Alimo. All those in favor to approve? Aye. 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 Any discussion? Hearing none, would Secretary please call the roll? When you, you know, have a chance. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Lou Fiore. Yeah, approve, yes. Linda DeGray. Four. Uh, Virginia Higley. Four. Francis Solano. Four. Kieran Majwadar. Four. Ken Halinski. Four. And John Petronella is four. I think it was show the, the unanimous 7 nothing vote. You're, you're all set from our standpoint, and uh, good luck this week, and I'll be sure I'll be seeing you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. When, whenever you're ready, John. Uh, the Edfield Planning and Zoning Commission will hold public hearings at the regular meeting Thursday, March 24, 2022, at 7 p.m. in the Town Hall Council Chambers, 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, concerning the following application. Public hearing number 3030, 
10 Hazard Avenue, special use permit application for a class three liquor permit, Equity One LLC owner, Grava, Gra, Gra, <laughs> Graav Bishno, applicant, map 56, lot 22, BR zone. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Would the applicant or the representative care to come forward? Good evening. Good evening. Can you just identify yourself for the record, please? My name is Gaurav Bishnoi. And your address, please? Your, your address. 24 Park Avenue. Okay. Thank you. Could you briefly describe um, you know, what you're asking for tonight? I'm asking for your permission to bring a wine store to this great town in Enfield, Connecticut. Okay. Is there questions from the commission? Now, uh, the location of this is in what I would call the uh, um, Shoprite uh, Staples Plaza. That's right. And, and whereabouts would your you know your your liquor store be basically? This is going to be in unit number six. That's between the Chinese restaurant and there's a hair salon I think next door to it. Is there anyone here in the public who'd like to speak for or against this application? Anybody in the public speak for or against this application for the last time? For or against? Seeing none, thank you. I have a question for the commission. Because I know we get so many, I hate, the word, hate to use this word, slots from the state of Connecticut for how many um, class threes we can have. I know, I know class four is a little bit different. So would you happen to know how many slots we are allotted and, and are we close to being full with how many uh, liquor stores we're allowed to have in Enfield? 17. 17 openings and I believe with this one it will complete that. So we would basically be full in the town of Enfield, so not class fours, which is just beer and, and right. grocery stores. But right. so that we'd be full for our, for our package store allocations after this one. So someone would have to close up so we get the slot back. So this is basically it for a, for a while. Okay. Right, there, there was a liquor store in the Coles Plaza, right. yeah. and they closed. Right, so that, closed. that allowed this slot to be open. Lucky man. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and just out of curiosity, just, just for education purposes, there's no appeal to the state for additional slots. I mean, that's what we're allotted, period. That is correct as far as I know. Okay, yeah. thank you. Does staff have any comments or anything they wish to make on this? No? Nothing other than uh, we measured it out and uh, it satisfied the distance for a thousand feet for the, anything being close uh, for a similar use. Um, other than that, it's to answer your questions based on population for the number of permits per town. That's all. Okay. Oh, thank you. That's good to know. Thank you. I, lo I love learning something new every day. Thank you. Is there any other commissioner comments, concerns? Commissioner Lamo? Yeah, you said. Wine, but you're applying for beer, wine, and spirits. Perfect. Yes, right. yes. You said just wine. I just wanted to make sure that that's clear. I'm going cool. to carry all three yeah. in terms of alcohol, also other non-alcoholic beverages, just to complement the whole shopping experience. But I like to consider the wine store as a more of an exclusive and more uh, more of a higher end uh, product that I like to carry. Thank you. Ah, okay, so you're going to be a higher end, going to specialize a little bit more in the high end of the wines. Um, yes, that's the idea, but you know, let's see how the, the population uh, uh, responds to it, and I'm always open to adjust my product offering based on that. Okay, great, thank you. Any more questions from commission? Nope. Staff? I'll take a motion to close this public hearing. So motion made by Commissioner Higley to close the public hearing. Second. Seconded Second. by Commissioner Petronella. All those in favor of closing the public hearing? Aye. Aye. Signify it was unanimous to close the public hearing. <clears throat> I'll take a motion to, uh, any discussion? No, I'll take a motion to approve. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, public hearing number 3030 in accordance with the resolution prepared by staff dated 324-22 with the uh, 26 conditions listed. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Holinsky. Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll take a roll call vote, please. Uh, Lou Fiore. Approved, four. Linda DeGray. Four. Virginia Higley. Four. Francis Salimo. Four. Kiran Majmudar. Four. Ken Helinski. Four. And John Petronella is four. But the record showed that that's application uh, passed uh, unanimously, seven to nothing. You're, you're all set, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. You too.
There's no old public hearings. There's no new business. And so now we go on to old business, which basically is to take off the table SPR 1882, 25 Hazard Avenue, site plan review for modification to a site plan, Paramount Realty Services, Inc., owner, AAA Club Alliance, applicant map 45, lot 8, BR zone. Is there a motion? To take this off the table. So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Higley, seconded by Commissioner nope. Petronella. So this is off the table. Um, Go ahead. The application applicant's <clears throat> team is here. Can you identify yourself for the record, please? Yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Uh, my name is Dave Zayax. I'm a professional engineer with F.A. Hesketh Associates, and we've been working with Paramount and AAA on this application. Um, at the last meeting, the um, it seemed like the commission didn't have any issues uh, other than your standard conditions for the actual uh, modifications to the site plan that we have been proposing, which really only affected um, what we're calling the owners or Paramount's portion of the work. Everything that was related to AAA's portion would stay the same, which is under construction right now. But the commission had some concerns about the idea of phasing the work such that um, the portion of the site that we looked at uh, that was Paramount's responsibility um, in, in the event that some of that work wasn't done, but AAA was finished, you know, uh, to the satisfaction of staff that they could issue a CO so that that facility could open. And then we had a discussion about, you know, well, how could we assure that uh, uh, the Paramount portion would be done, at least in a timely fashion, and, uh, you know, we wouldn't have a situation where we had AAA 100% done and then the owner maybe was uh, lollygagging along or something for whatever reason they were delayed. So I went back to Paramount and I explained the situation. And uh, as it turns out, they had been under negotiations with several contractors to do uh, work, th that work, and also some other work on the site that I call sort of general maintenance, uh, you know, pavement things that were going to be done this summer, curbing, things of that nature that take place on a large shopping center like that on an annual basis. And for instance, there's some paving that's going to be done in front of um, uh, the new Starbucks that wasn't completed last year. They're going to be doing some additional paving over there. It's, you know, general maintenance that they do on the shopping center. So anyhow, uh, Paramount, what they provided me was a letter to um, the zoning enforcement officer, officer, which I think you have a copy of. Um, I, I apologize for only being able to uh, submit it today, but it takes a while to get these things out of these large corporations. Um, but basically, from the director of construction, Mr. Eric Kelly, who's very familiar with the site, um, he's indicated uh, to Rick that uh, to advise the commission that um, they have entered into a contract with Delaware Valley Paving, who does a lot of work for them up and down the coast. And uh, they will be completing their work as shown on uh, LA1 revised, um, you know, in, in accordance with the uh, commission's package. Um, they will be doing that, and they expect to have all their work done by the end of April. Um, and I provided for the uh, commission a copy of the uh, proposal that's just been executed um, with uh, Delaware Valley Paving. Um, they're also evaluating um, this. This contract was signed uh, for the purposes of finishing the AAA area work. And they're working with the same firm on uh, additional contracts for repairing of some loading areas and that additional paving and then the paving of the main driveway back out to Freshwater Boulevard, which is really not part of the site plan application, but that's just maintenance work that needs to be done out there. So I hope this is acceptable to the commission. Uh, as it turns out, to be perfectly honest with you, between where AAA is and where these folks are, it's all going to be done by the end of April anyhow, so the phasing may not be actually necessary anyhow, but I felt I don't want to change the application again. The application is the application, and if we're off a couple of days because it rains for seven straight days at the end of April or something and we can't line stripe something, uh, I felt, let's just leave the flexibility with the application the way it is, but you have the assurity from you know, Paramount, the owners, and uh, and they have obviously they've, they've executed a contract, so the work is going to happen. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. You might well, have. One, one of the things I like to start, and I do want to hear from Rick. But one, one of the things I have noticed, which which kind of be quite frankly has perturbed me somewhat, is when I go back and read all the documentation. It just seems to me, and I'm not saying you personally, mm -hmm. just saying this project certainly was notified a year ago that this potential problem was going to occur about needing the need to possibly phase this project. And here we are 
last two weeks ago or so or three weeks ago being had this application come in front of us uh, what I would call under the gun just doesn't quite sit right with me I, you know I've, I we have documentation here this goes back to March of 2021 where some of these issues were brought to who's ever was in charge of this uh, this project's concern so having said I do appreciate the uh, March 24th uh, letter you did brought from the, from the uh, owner of this and that's probably all I want to say right now so I'm going to look around to the following commissioners if they have any more concerns or comments here if not, that would staff like to update us from their uh, their opinion on where we are as of tonight with this project? Oh, well, I, I guess so. Well, as he alluded to, or Dave alluded to, this just came in this afternoon. This has not been sent to. I know the commission had a concern about it going to town attorney for review or whatever the my case may be. Um, the question of bonds came up, and I believe, from my memory only, that bonds were. In place only for uh, ENS and landscaping, uh, and they were posted by AAA, not Paramount in itself. So I, I, I know what he's saying that uh, it may be all completed at the same time and it may be a moot point, but we have not run anything by regarding a uh, paving bond requirement for this at this point in time. Well, I actually have. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so um, there is a section in our regulations, 9.10.5E, which does state, and, and I was talking to Maria Elson, our, one of our town attorneys, about this, um, and she said as long as it's in the regulations specifically that we could require bonding, and this states the applicant may request and the commission may grant a phasing of bond posting. All phasing of the bonding shall match the phasing on the approved site plan, and the applicant shall supply written detail of all work to be completed in each phase, which shall match the phasing lines on the final plans. All work within a particular <coughs> excuse me, phase <coughs> must be fully completed to the satisfaction sorry, okay. of the directors of planning and public works prior to the start of any work associated with any subsequent phase or phases. So we do have the right to require a bond for the pavement um, based on that. And, and I think that we typically have not done that in the past, but we haven't had this request in the past, to the best of my knowledge. This is kind so, of which is, which is why we were like, oh, I'm not sure if we could do that. Yeah. And, and if, I, if I may, if I have the privilege of the chair, if I may, um, just conversing with staff, one of the other things that bothers me especially if we granted this for the phasing of this project, is that it could possibly be precedent setting. Um, I don't think we've done that too often. Um, and I'm just concerned about doing that, especially the gentleman here is probably would like us to do that, but he's also said we maybe might not need to. Looks like they're nearing the finishing line here. So um, I just have a, a problem with, with that, um, to be quite frank. It's not the site plan. The site plan changes, I, I think, are Fine, I don't have a problem with that, but the phasing just still, I, I just have, I'm having a difficulty with that. Even though I do want to thank you for the effort you've put in to get this. Uh, I told you I'd this. come back. Yeah, no, it's, thank you. I do appreciate that. I mean, what I only can suggest to the commission is, um, you know, phasing things is, and, and bonding things, you know, wh whether it's landscape. I mean, very often we bond the landscaping, whether you've already done it or not, because the winter conditions or something, you're not going to hold up opening a business because it wasn't finished landscaping or something. But if you feel that you need to have the provision in the, you know, you're gonna make, an, you're gonna make a condition of the approval to require a bond in the event that they're not finished, then I suggest you just do so. But I would still like to leave the phasing thing in there because I just know the way things are in, con in the construction world today and with everything, a little flexibility is not bad because the world we are in today with construction and material cost, you know, materials are being available, blah, 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 everything good heartedly. We're all saying we're going to be done by the end of April, but you know, just in case something goes wrong, we know the triple a building will be ready. They're, they're going like gangbusters out there. Yep. Commissioner Helensky. Yeah. Um, if I recall from the last meeting, we, our big concern was the fact that would you finish the as asphalt once you were done with the AAA building. And I'm not questioning your integrity or anything like that. But that seems to be our biggest concern. And so um, I'm looking for still a way that guarantees that the 
paving would be done, you know, at the same time as the building, or we wouldn't issue approval until the paving was completed. Well, AAA's paving will be done. Okay. Everything that's in the AAA phase will be done. Okay. The rest of it's really maintenance, reconstruction. The whole, the whole uh, application here, uh, site plan review, is for the whole thing. The site it's plan not, is. not just for right. the AAA that's right. portion. So I'm still concerned about guaranteeing that the entire thing would be done. I'm not sure this letter does that. In, in and of itself, the fact that you, you know, they've contracted the paving people and come up with a date of April 30th. And I understand there's weather problems and all that kind of stuff that, that may delay it. But, uh, you know, I'm still looking for a, a guarantee that, that it would be all completed at once. That's my opinion. Thank you. Commissioner Majmdar. Yeah, hi. Thank you for taking the time and the effort to make it all work. I just want to make sure that this estimate is for both phases or both portions of the work. This estimate is only for the owner's portion. Very AAA sure. is... Oh, this is not the AAA. We're not asking for any delay in AAA. When AAA is ready to be finished, Rick so and staff will say that. this is an estimate for that. phase two? Yes. This is the That's owner's portion, is. Yeah, the westerly portion. Okay. And Only. Question for the staff, is that okay? Yes, please. Uh, has the staff, the engineering, et cetera, have looked at it? Are they, they have not? No, no, of course Even not. Like, but, I mean, you certainly could make that a condition of approval that the numbers are corroborated by uh, the, the engineering department. Right. So, so in the event we ask for a bond or put in the condition yeah. for a bond, this would be mm -hmm. reviewed by the engineering office. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that'd be my suggestion. So, Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Higley. When is AAA slated to open, to be finished, to open? They are telling me that they, the, about the middle of April. Thank They're you. planning on paving as soon as the plants are open. Thank you. Commissioner Petronelli. Yeah. So as a condition of approval, uh, we could stipulate uh, if you're coming in for phase one CO, we could stipulate that you would have to put in a, uh, put up a bond uh, in the amount of probably this quote or thereabouts to be verified by the town engineer. Um, and uh, that would that would be our guarantee to, uh, or the guarantee that we would have that it would eventually get done. Do you, is there any issue with that? Um, no, I mean, if that's the wish of the if that's what the commission and, and provided says. that you would need it, uh, yeah, I, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I you know, I, I can't guarantee anything, but based on my conversations, everyone's intent yeah. is to finish this whole thing by the end of April. Yeah. Are, are, are well, I, I, you know, John knows we, we we've we've done lots of projects. Yeah. It's there's always that right yeah. that weak slippage for some reason or something, and we don't want to have AAA sitting there with a multi-million dollar building, waiting for um, the owner to put up um, a stop sign or, or 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 stripe something or something that they need to do. That's their part. It's that that's their part of the shopping center. It, it doesn't affect AAA. But you would have the ability to say, uh, uh, let's say it's a week before you're looking for the CO, and 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 it says, well, listen, we want the CO on Friday. We're not going to get the phase two paving done, so let's post that bond right now and let's get it and submit it to the town so that we can apply for our CO. Right. It, that, that's how it would work. I, I, yes. I don't think anybody's asking that you just post it where you may not need it because um, that's that's that's. An yeah, I would say by the middle of April we'll know if it's a full go or or if there's an issue or not, and then at that time we'd have to work with staff and post a bond. Okay, so that's an option that we can we can do. This, a quick question for this, if you don't mind, I just want to come to kind of try to pull here. I'm taking it from all the lack of comments that no one has a problem with the site plan changes they wanted. So I think we're, right. I'm not taking a vote, I'm just looking for something, you know, where we're headed here. Mm -hmm. So from a site plan standpoint, that seems to be okay with this commission. We haven't voted. I'm just looking around here for some nods. And yep. um, so the hang up really seems to be whether we want to allow the phasing in of this project. And it sounds to me also one of the recommendations or thoughts is those who are supporting 
phasing in this project would want to have a bond uh, assigned to it um, that had, you know, that staff approved, all, all levels of staff in town hall approved. And there seems to be some that don't want to even go that route. So it seems to be that's where we are. Right? Am I, am I misjudging anything? Does staff want to have anything to, to add to what I just said? I, wait, hold on. Give me a second. Christopher Majmandar has something? Oh, okay. No, I was going to ask the staff a question. Oh, please. Uh, does the town, the PZC, this commission has a right to ask for a bond on a property that the applicant doesn't own? We have the right to require a bond for phasing. And that's and and what Rick is concerned about is um, issuing a CO that's based on the site plan. But by approving this, if you were to approve this tonight, it would modify the site plan with the phasing line. Right. So I think I think we would be covered that way, and we do have the right, right to so we'll be require the bond. Okay. Thank you. Ladies first, don't we? Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. Thank Just you. Thank one you, question, Martin. because. I do know what it's like to to do property management and things. This is just a proposal. Has the contract been signed so that these people are saying, yep, we're definitely going to do our best to meet the 30th for the paving? I'm, God forbid, you know, weather does whatever yeah. weather. No, the answer is yes. I've been assured by Mr. Kelly that that's the case. He is in charge of construction for Paramount. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lamo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I think it was at the last meeting where I kind of laid out this plan going forward for the applicant to come back, um, you know, with the bond, with some paperwork, with the town attorney's approval before tonight. So and obviously this came in today. Mm -hmm. um, so with Lori's discussion with the town attorney about the phasing and the bonding, I think for me, that covers my concern with the town attorney approval from, from of what was turned into us. So, and then based on this letter from the director of construction for Paramount Realty and the attached documentation of the paving that's going to be done, giving it conditional um, approval. Them being a large, a huge player in town with a with a, with a very large piece of property, well maintained mall i think that you know on its face we we should take this letter and, and cooperating with one of our major tenants I, I mean i think this letter has merit and um along with the other conditions that we're able to put on this relative to bonding i think that covered all the th i think the three things i said at the last meeting that would make me comfortable the town attorney piece I think was a discussion with Lori again. Um, the the face on the face of the letter from the from the owners, and um, some of the leeway we have that you know Commissioner Petronella mentioned, with the conditions of approval. I'm comfortable moving forward with this. Okay. Thank, I had a quick. I had a quick. For anybody else, I had a quick question for staff. But I'll let them finish their chat. If anybody doesn't mind, we'll take a thirty second wink break here. Let them finish what they're discussing. No. Yeah. I had a question for staff. If you're, I didn't want to, wanted you to finish. Sorry, it. we're, yeah, we're that's looking okay. at conditions of approval that, that's and, and uh, giving a CO. So, and basically, the way this application came in, just from, from my own education, there's no way um, at this point to vote for the site plan but against the phasing. It's, we have to take this whole application as a whole. If. <laughs> I think I, I got confused there, but um, basically they have a site plan tonight. Yep. It's already approved. Yep. They what they're, site plan what they're asking to do is came. to add a phasing line to that site plan, which would then become the new approved site plan. Okay. And then we would um, bond for a part of it. And we were just looking at the, the conditions. But the original app that came certain. in had some site plan changes to it. Did, did those get redacted? Originally, there was moving some storm drains and doing this and doing that. So minor modifications are not are pretty standard. Okay, so that that's not I a consideration. Don't think that, that you know, the, we do require an A two survey. Yep. 
for a certificate of occupancy, but we can require the A2 sur survey for the phased, one, if you approve the phasing okay. tonight. Okay. Is there any other discussion? I think we've gone through this for quite, quite a while. I think we know what our <laughs> options are. Um, I'll entertain um, uh, a, a motion to approve, um, I guess probably with some conditions, I'm sure. Yep. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give it a stab. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, SPR number 1882, 25 Hazard Avenue, Site Plan Review, Paramount Realty Services, Inc. Owner, AAA Club Alliance, Inc. Applicant, Map 45, Lot 8, BR Zone, approval of the site plan modification being in accordance with the submitted revised plans in accordance with the listed 26 conditions and uh, added condition um, number 27, uh, uh, reading subject to the owner posting a bond and an amount approved by the town engineer if required for phase construction to obtain a certificate of occupancy. Could I clar clarify that the bond would be for pavement? Well, I think there's more to, for, there's also landscaping in this bond. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is, is the I, landscaping already covered under the yeah, original Yeah, we've already bond? got a landscaping bond for the entire site. Okay. Work. Okay. But the landscaping bond is, but the landscaping bond is for AAA, and what we're talking about with this bond is for the privately owned person. Right. So it is landscaping in addition to what AAA put up, right? Because it's, it's shown on the, the quote. The landscaping? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We can do that. Hmm? Yeah. We, we can do that. Okay. So landscaping okay. and pavement. So the bond would be for paving and landscaping? Yep. Okay. Correct. Okay. Is That's for phase two. Yeah. Is there a second on that? Second. Second by... <laughs> Commissioner Majidar had his hand up first. Sorry, Commissioner Linsky. No <laughs> you guys are so quick. Having said that, there's a motion. Roll call vote, Mr. Secretary. Okay. Uh, Lou Fiore? Commi Lou Fiore is against. I don't believe it's in the best interest of the town of Enfield to phase this project. Uh, Linda DeGray? Against. I don't believe it would set the right precedent if we phase a site plan that's already been approved. Virginia Higley. Against. I agree with both the uh, chair and uh, Commissioner DeGray that it's not in good standing. Uh, Francis Alimo. I'm for, for the reasons I mentioned before. Uh, Kiran Majmudar. I'm for. Uh, Kenneth Helensky. For. And John Petronella is for. Let so the record show to, four to three. pass four to three with the bonding conditions, so you're on your way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank and you. Hopefully the next application I bring before you will be a little less complicated. Yes. It's okay. Good idea. It's not, not, no, no one's blaming you. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you. No, thank you, and thank you, Commissioner. That was a good discussion, and uh, mm -hmm. this goes to show we all have independent uh, minds, and we're thinking yep. things through, and we're working well as a, con, uh, as a commission. Yep. yep. All right. On to other business. Discussion on cannabis. I, th I think we have to take it off the table. Motion to take it off the table by Commissioner Alamo. Thank you. Seconded by Commissioner DeGray to take item A, discussion on cannabis, off the table for discussion. Um, if you don't mind, a privilege of the chair. We agreed uh, last uh, meeting to have this passed on to CROG for review. But in the meantime, some of you and, and staff partaked uh, in that. And I wasn't able to, I, I want to say the Casio Cannabis yep workshop and um, staff had some recommendations they wanted added to this. So, so uh, that's why we didn't go to Krog. That's why it's still on our agenda. So uh, Lori, would you like to just uh, brief us what you recommending you add added to uh, this? Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> so um, my, my allergies, I apologize. So I, uh, based on that workshop, I thought that we should clarify one, the vehicle parking. Um, so we've added, um, we modified G 
and that basically just refers back to our parking schedule for uh, dispensing facilities shall follow retail parking standards, cultivation shall shall follow warehousing standards, and hybrid facility shall park shall follow parking standards based on the percentage of each use. And then the parking requirements in Thompsonville shall follow requirements in Article 8.123, which is basically Thompsonville. Right, council right. code. Yep. <clears throat> and then um, mo more importantly, I just thought that, and this is not something that has to be in here, but I just thought it, would, it just kind of helped bring the issues home. Um, I added H, in addition to the standard site plan and special permit standards and procedures in Article 9, the applicant sh shall specifically address the systems to be used for odor control, water use and wastewater discharge, noise abatement, external equipment and screening, site lighting, traffic, fire, and security. So that that's, uh, again, I think that that's all going to be addressed through the state, but I think you should also have a say in some of it. Thank you. And I, and I, if I may, I think it's, I, I'm glad that the staff did this, because we, as you know, we are going to have a public hearing, and thus this being in there in a public hearing shows uh, the residents that staff in, in this commission has thought about these things, and they're up front here. Some of it might be redundant, but I think it's uh, you know, well worth adding and well worth holding off sending it to Krog. So I'm looking around since we, I don't see anybody with any agita over this. Um, uh, so if we can just have a show of hands to close this issue and, and invite staff to get this off the Krog. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye, thank you. So okay. off the Krog this goes. Thank you very much. We have to wait for Krog before we hold a public hearing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we, so yeah. what we will do is um, schedule a public hearing two meetings from now. We'll send it to Krog tomorrow, and that should... You think we'll have it back in time? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. They have 30 days. Okay. So if it's not back from Krog, we have to postpone a public hearing? Um, no, they have 30 days. So if, have 30 if, days. We don't, if, if we don't hear from them within 30 days, we still are able to move forward. However, it's a long... We have this next week, which is a long uh, fifth week, so we're going to be fine. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, food truck regulations. I think we received. Uh, yeah. Yep. Um, um, that that was tabled. Yes, it was. So I'm taking motion to please take food truck regulations off the table. Oh. Well, I thought. Uh, motion made by Commissioner Higley, seconded by Commissioner Lyon. We'll take it off the table because I think there's an update. Yep. Go, go ahead, Commissioner Higley. Um, they we. It was sent. It was approved and sent, I believe, to the uh, governor's desk to, for signature. Uh, for yes. for an extension of thirteen months. Well, that, it's that's not food truck regulations. That's uh, outside outdoor dining. dining. Oh, I'm sorry. Nope. I'm sorry. Outdoor dining was it was it was uh, voted on by both chambers. Yeah, I mean it's it's going to it. it I mean it kind of ties into it, but the actual act yeah. is I is thought, for the outside dining. Okay, but the which food trucks, includes food trucks. The food trucks have been approved, right? No, they're included. No, they're, they're included in included. outside dining. Right. Yeah. That's how the food trucks are operating right now. Right. Under yeah. the outside dining. Right. So which has been extended. The outside dining will be extended. Yep. Okay. Send it the wrong way. So when yeah. that you, happens, you, we, we'll be able to remove this from our agenda, and wait till this temporary regulations yep. expire again, yep. and go through the motion again. I think it's uh, April of 2023. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yes. Okay. So let's put this back on the table with a yep. nice update. Motion made by Commissioner Higley. Seconded by Commissioner Majumdar to table this. Uh, so item B goes back on the table mm -hmm. until we have some real things are signed up and then we'll remove it off. Does that sound agreeable to everybody? Yep. yep. Great. Now we're going to go on to the gentleman here for, for discussion on the solar project. Um, you out? I'm going to announce both of them. <laughs> uh, discussion on solar project uh, 289 Shaker Road and discussion on solar project map 100 lot 5 north street okay thank you Rod. And, and if i if i may just out of curiosity <coughs> gentlemen are you were you waiting to participate tonight or they're the, they're the other solar oh, oh okay i thought you guys were all together no, okay uh, oh, okay thanks. thank you good evening Thank you. Is the mic on? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, a little closer. My name is Tim Kuhn. I'm a professional engineer with J.R. Russo and Associates. I'm here tonight uh, representing a, a group of people, uh, including Connecticut Green Bank, 
uh, Sun Power Corporation and Advanced Power Generation. This is kind of the design and team the, that is sponsoring the, these green bank projects or solar projects. Um, what the Connecticut Green Bank is, it's a quasi-state agency which was developed to promote the green energy and they're the ones that are looking to uh, or actually leading the charge on these projects. Um, this one that I'm presenting tonight here in Enfield is one of four that they are working on, um, which are four solar projects at the Department of Correction facilities. They have two other projects down in Cheshire and one in, uh, at summer, in Summers right up the street uh, off of Shaker Road. Um, what they are, what's being proposed is solar fields behind the meter. So that means it's not going to be power out to the grid. They're strictly providing power for their own facilities at the Department of Corrections uh, properties. So the Enfield site, which is the one for discussion tonight, is located at 289 Shaker Road. And this is the the overall site plan and if looking at the the bottom of the screen you'll see shaker road taylor road is on the left to the west and the kind of uh, magenta is where the solar field is going to the rear of that is the enfield correctional facility and to the east to the right is the willard facility so overall this parcel is about 371 acres um, it's rather large um, and what we're proposing is a 4.4 acre fenced area uh, which will contain the arrays. Um, these arrays will pr produce about 1.14 megawatts AC of power and there will be four different transmission lines. Um, one which you can see kind of going off to the right and around the Willard facility. Uh, so a portion of the array will provide power for the Willard facility. Another transmission line goes straight north up to uh, another transformer that exists on the edge of the driveway. And then there are two more transmission lines that will wrap around the driveway all the way to the back of the facility where there are two additional transformers. So the, the array itself is going to be a single construction project, but it's really four different power generation projects all in one array. So. The, the array, as you can see, it's going to be located in an area that which is currently maintained as open field. There, we did have a wetland delineation completed and wetlands were identified on the site. There were uh, actually just to the north of the array, you can see a small isolated wetland that was flagged and that's associated it's at, at the end of a, uh, the drainage outfall from the parking lot. It's a little isolated wetland there. And then down between the array and Shaker Road at the bottom of the page, there's another isolated wetland where the water appears to weep out of the ground uh, at that location. So we, we have designed this uh, in order to avoid and, and minimize any impacts to those wetlands. Uh, the state uh, Connecticut Department of Environmental Energy and Environmental Protection has recently developed new guidelines for solar projects, um, large solar projects that are under the jurisdiction of the Siting Council, which I'll mention, get into later. But for those, um, they have specific uh, setback requirements, uh, which, especially for wetlands, they require a 100-foot setback from a panel from the wetland, which we are adhering to. There's a 50-foot non-disturbed zone from a wetland, which we are also adhering to. There are some exceptions, um, but we're not uh, we're not looking for any of those because we can actually meet those requirements. So, as I mentioned, um, it is an open field, so this project is not going to require any clearing. Um, it also is going to take advantage of the existing grades out there. So we're just going to put the solar panels out in the existing field. It's not going to require us regrading. Um, so that really, it, it limits our soil disturbance significantly. Really now the soil disturbance is, is only going to be associated with the construction of our stormwater management basins. Um, it also means we get to maintain the existing drainage patterns, which is just sheet flow across the field, as well as the existing vegetation, which is important because it's going to reduce and minimize any type of sedimentation and erosion. 
that's there. Um, the two, there are two stormwater management basins located at the south of the facility, or, and these were designed in accordance with the state's uh, stormwater quality guidelines um, to provide essentially groundwater recharge and retain uh, runoff so that there's no increase in peak discharge from the site. Um, they will have level spreaders so that any runoff will be just distributed back into the fields and eventually probably make it into that wetland. Um, and there's also emergency overflows as well. We did meet with the DEP back in January, I believe, to discuss our stormwater plan, our drainage plan, and we received their comments and they were uh, very favorable on how we're dealing with the stormwater at this location. So the fence will be, or the array will be surrounded by security fence, chain link fence. Um, it'll be elevated to allow any critters to be able to continue to pass through, which is common practice these days. And one thing about this particular location is there's really no residences other than those behind bars um, that are going to be looking at this. So there's no real vis uh, sensitive visual receptors to, the, to this particular location. So we feel we have a good location uh, in order to do this and, and provide green energy. So. Um, and as I did mention, the size of this is, is over the one megawatt, and that's what triggers this to be a siting council project. So it falls within the jurisdiction of the Connecticut Siting Council and not doesn't require any applications from you, the, the town boards. However, we are coming before you tonight to, to present the plan, um, solicit your comments, any recommendations you may have, and hopefully be able to incorporate those in the plans because we, we want you guys to be happy. It is a project in Enfield, and we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing for the town. Um, so ultimately, and, and we did this with the, the Wetlands Commission. We were here last week with them. Um, we will request, or I do request, that hopefully after this presentation, after I answer any questions that you may have, you feel comfortable enough to either to permit your staff to just write a, a brief letter in support of this project um, so that we can present that to the siting council because uh, they look at that favorably um, when we they know we've been to the town and have uh, sought their input. So at this point in time, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Commissioner DeGray? I, you said you're going to have uh, a fence around these and you're going to be, it's going to be raised for the little critters. There's flock, a huge flock of turkeys out there and then there's a large herd of deer. How high is this fence going to be? Because the fence, the detail shows, I believe we are eight inches off the ground mm -hmm. to the bottom and then it's a seven foot high fence. Okay. I'm just wondering because deer do jump fences and, and that's... My Hopefully life. that's high enough that they won't be trying to attempt that. <laughs> I don't know how yeah, high they jump, yeah, but, no. you know, just a question. All right, thank you. I have a question. Oh, sure. Let's um, as regards size of arrays, where would you classify this as far as total size from the ones you've been involved with? Like, is this a, a very big one? No. A medium size one? It looks fairly small to it, me. It is, really. It is, it is, tip, it is small. Um, and where would you classify a zero to 100 percent, 100 percent being the biggest? Well, uh, I, I don't know. I would say most of the ones that I've been involved in have been uh, between one and two megawatts in size. But I know there's much larger ones out there. They they get up to, you know, uh, hundreds of megawatts in size that take up acres and acres. Actually, the one recently approved in East Windsor at, uh, I can't remember how big that is, but this... It much bigger, <laughs> considerably okay. bigger. And, uh, but this is where, you know, the siting council, they take jurisdiction at essentially one megawatt, and we're at 1.14. So we're just triggering yeah. what what okay. their requirements are. Okay, thank you. I think Commissioner Grillo went in for you, but have you, come on. Um, I guess this is for the commissioners, basically. Uh, is this what we want? For, for, we've got solar over here solar over here is this what we want Frenfield? all these solar panels every 
Are you? Are you? I know. I'm just saying, but are you looking for discussion, or would you like to have my response? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of the, this is clean energy, the way we're going in the future. It's benefiting you right now? It's, this is benefiting the state of Connecticut, this particular project, in which it adversely, or not adversely, but somehow not use the wrong term there, it does benefit me in the long run. I mean, this is this in wind, um, is solar and wind, and I would even like to see, even hope we see more hydro. This is the way we should be going. And this is not intrusive. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm kind of surprised it's not larger. And I know I know the land pretty well, but I guess you're delineated by some of the wetland issues. Yeah. Because yeah. they certainly could. And could actually, they, they, they looked at this and they looked at what the actual power needs were for the facilities up there. And, and kind of they, that's where they started. They said, all right, it, it's not providing 100 percent, but it, it uh, you know, they did an analysis and determined, all right, how much do we really need and what size do we want to make this? So, this, this is what they came up with, and, and regardless, they did that before we actually did the wetland delineation, so they, they knew how many panels they really wanted to put out there, so uh, we were able to meet that goal. So I hope, I hope I, at least I answered your question. I don't know if you want to ask all the commissioners or should we move on to Commissioner Mahajmandar? We move on. We move on, right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Come on. <laughs> Mine are more uh, comments than actual questions, but the first one is, my understanding is the state siting council has approved so many sites throughout the state are in the process of doing it. So this, I'm assuming, is one such site that was already preliminarily or somehow approved. So as far as developing it as a solar panel installation site, the town has basically just an advisory function would that be about accurate that that is accurate yes this this does fall under the connecticut siting council because of its size they have the jurisdiction and um really it's it's they do encourage you to go to the towns and to seek their input but um they would treat your recommendation just they, like they would treat an abutter's recommendation it, and ultimately the decision falls with them uh, on the permitting so we have the town basically has the uh, whatever suggestions they may have to approve it with do whatever extra condition or extra things here or don't do the other that's about it yes yeah, essentially because the town, yeah, th there's no permitting involved with the town for something like this. Okay. And the second was, you may not be aware, but how much of the state's two facilities requirements is this going to meet? 50%, 60%, 80%? I do not know what the, how much the percentage is that this meets for the pris those prison facilities. I'm, I'm not aware of that. All right. That's about it. Thank you. Commissioner Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so what I was going to say, basically, we don't have any jurisdiction over this. We no. can't turn it down. And no. to Commissioner uh, Majumar's comments, you know, we can say what we feel, and you can— yes. and, and we we, will, we welcome those. If right, you have and they can say, we'll take it under yeah. advisement. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yep. They can yes. say, we'll take it under advisement. Correct. That's it. But, right. but as the right. applicant, okay. we as the applicant, it's we not do our best end. before yeah. we even go to the siting so, council yeah. to try to satisfy yeah. So Yeah, so anything we say, it'll— Take it under advisement. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Higley? Just out of curiosity, you're putting up a seven-foot fence with so much underneath for the critters. Will that cover the panels, or will people still see the panels? The panels themselves are on the low side. I believe the detail showed it two-foot minimum. They typically, I think, range from two to three feet off of the ground on the low side, and then they're angled at 20%. Or 25, I can't remember which one this is. And the top of the panel, and I think these are 20%, because I think the top of the panels here are around eight or nine feet off of the ground. So you will still see them? The very tip. And the other issue here that you have is that really this slopes, it, it's on a slope. It goes from the road up to the prison, right. so the, the fence up front may screen the first one, but you're going to see them right. above that. Right. Thank you. Because it goes, it goes uphill. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? No. Having said that, I, I would like to um, propose that we do s have staff write up a letter of s in support of this without any clear outstanding issues. And we support this project and hope to see many more. Is that agreeable to everyone? No. Yeah, Thank you. Make a, uh, suggestion. 
suggestion that we would like to, in the letter said, we support the solar project of this particular location. Yes, absolutely. That's that's that's, that's what I said. Location. Yes. Yeah, we're just talking about this location. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. I Thank appreciate you your Thank time. You Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with the project. Thank you. Any any idea or this I before you go? Timeline? Um, they are actually hoping to get siting council approval and be able to start this summer. Great. So that they can um, hopefully get things going and finish in one construction season. So. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. So now we have discussion on solar project at map 100, lot 5, North Street. Gentlemen. With the golf ranges. Yeah. Solar yeah. Yep. Good evening. Good evening. Make sure you start a routine so you can make sure the mic's yep. on and identify yourselves yeah. and who you represent for the record, please. All right. Good evening. Yeah. My name is Brian Fitzgerald. You might, yeah, I might need to pull it closer to you. Yeah, so thanks. Get in here. Good evening. My name is Brian Fitzgerald. This is my colleague, Brad Parsons. We are from a solar energy developer based on Hartford, Connecticut, right down the road here. And we're here to speak to you tonight about a four megawatt solar project located south of North Street uh, here in Enfield, Connecticut. So there is some materials that we provided. If you guys have it in front of you, what we'll do is just take a quick run down our agenda here, the table of contents. And then we'll work our way through this rather quickly and just try to open up the floor up for discussion, questions, sure. comments. Which document are you working off of? We have a document titled Planning and Zoning Presentation, March 24th. Yep, 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 I got it. So we'll run through just a quick introduction to the project, touch on public need, where that comes from, site selection processes, proposed conditions, our site development plan, community outreach and public relations, and then we'll get into our summary, development work, environmental research that's been conducted to date, and then we'll let you guys know about our development schedule and next steps. So from that perspective, Enfield Solar One, as we're calling the project, is a four megawatt AC ground mounted fixed tilt project located on about 20 acres of a 73 acre parcel over on North Street. And the uh, pursuant to general statute 1650K, uh, the project is under the jurisdiction of the Connecticut Siting Council as it is greater than four megawatts. With that said, we had been working with a number of staff members for the town, from the town manager's office to uh, Lori Witten about the project. We've met a couple times. And as a general part of our development process, we come into the town, we speak with the different commissions, we'll likely give a presentation to the town council within the next couple weeks as well about the project. We'll take comments, uh, feedback, questions, all of that into consideration as we work towards producing our site and council package. So while we're doing that, we'll also submit for and look to receive a Connecticut stormwater permit from uh, Connecticut Deep. So the parcel itself that the project is located on <clears throat> is zoned in R33, but we do have industrial zoned abutters directly to our north, directly to our east, and directly to our west. Um, the project will comply with Connecticut Deep Air and Water Quality Standards. Again, it is a zero emission generating resource, meaning there's no emissions that come from the generation of the electricity produced by the project. There's no use of water. There's no production of wastewater. We are not tying into any uh, facilities that are run and operated by the town of Enfield. We will interconnect to the existing distribution network, but that is our coordination with Eversource. And then moving on to slide five, we will talk a little bit about public need coming down from the state level, just generally speaking, where these projects come from. Which one's slide five? Uh, slide five has the icons on the left side there. Thank you. Yep, yeah, got it. Thank you. Absolutely. So as you mentioned previously, Chairman, the state has energy goals. They have currently a zero carbon electricity goal by 2040. The state seeks to be 100% free of, of carbon emission resources to produce electricity by that date. So the state has that goal. And then state uh, legislation comes to and state programs pop up run by DEEP and Eversource in this case to go out and, and acquire long-term contracts to procure energy from these generating resources. 
So with that said, this project is participating in what's called the Shared Clean Energy Facility Program here in Connecticut. And we commonly abbreviate it with an acronym called SCEF, S-C-E-F. And what this project is and what it means is that we have a contract for 20 years to sell electricity back to Eversource. Now through that program, what Eversource is mandated to do is to take all of that electricity production and allocate it to low and moderate income customers in the residential sector and in the uh, service industry. So LMI, housing authorities, LMI uh, residents, they will go ahead and opt in at least 50% of the production from the project. They will opt those customers in and then additional customer bases like residents uh, here in Connecticut within Eversource territory, I should add, can choose to opt in. Uh, residents can, businesses can, and municipal customers can also opt in. So the premise of the program is that the electricity gets, that gets produced here in Enfield is gonna be delivered to Eversource, and they're gonna allocate credits that are worth two and a half cents per kilowatt hour across the generation on each subscriber's monthly bill. So that's effectively where the public need for the project comes from, how, we, how we're here today. Again, the state has the goals. Uh, agencies like DEEP and Eversource come together to produce the procurements. We respond to those procurements with these projects to participate in the programs and ultimately get forward developing them. So oh, that's all right. Moving forward here to slide six, we'll take a quick look. We've got an image here with the proposed project location there. So site selection and environmental, right? How do we get to these, these sites here that we've chosen, the one that's in front of us today? Now, from a, from a regulatory perspective, ground-mounted solar is, is pretty heavily regulated here in the state of Connecticut. We have to do quite a bit of work with Connecticut Deep on the uh, species side of things with natural diversity database consultations, as well as the stormwater department, ensuring that the project is gonna meet and adhere to the stormwater requirements of the Connecticut Deep. So with that said, we have three main features that we focus on when looking to these project sites. One is environmental characteristics. Are we gonna impact any wetlands? Are there any wetlands or vernal pools present on the site? What other environmental features does the site have? Is it forested? Are there known to be threatened or endangered species? So the key here with our site is we're not directly impacting or, or indirectly impacting any wetlands or any vernal pool resources. We do have a small wetland that comes just briefly into our parcel from the east, but we, we have adequate setbacks from that wetland habitat. So our next item to look at is topography. And up here in Enfield, as you are well aware, land is often very flat, which is key for solar. And it's where our state regulators really push us to go and to try and develop these projects. So our site here has grades that don't exceed one and a half to 2% in any instance. Very flat piece of land, good southern exposure, uh, not currently forested. There's not going to be any bit of tree clearing that's required with the project. So that's another key for us. But we have environmental, topography, and then interconnection viability. So we have good interconnection viability. We've completed impact studies with Eversource that tell us that we can interconnect the project here safely with minimal upgrades uh, paid for and, and brought to the network by us as the project developer. We take that on. Um, in this case, it was, a, it was a minimal upgrade coming off of good three-phase circuit off on Park Street. So, and really the, the fourth feature when we're thinking about where we're gonna site these projects is the location, it's surrounding land use, future and current land use of the parcel, what's going on here, is it compatible with the, with the surrounding land use? And in this instance, we believe it is because we have industrial abutters uh, to the north, to the east, and to the west. And our development here and our plan is very, very low impact. So from a site development perspective, as I mentioned, there's no tree clearing, there is very limited site grading and, um, and uh, just minimal stormwater features that need to be added in per the, the per Connecticut deep guidelines. So from that perspective, we have a very straightforward development process and a construction process as well. And then moving on to slide seven, we have a, a site plan here that my colleague Brad Parsons, who's a professional engineer who we have on staff, Brad works with us on these projects. He was going to run through this here with us, but we'll get started. And if he comes back in time, he'll be able to to pick it up where we are. So to, to orient everyone who's looking at the page here, um, up is north, directly down is south. Just off of our page to the left is would be Park Street running north to south, and then North Street 
kind of coming out of the west and running to the east to orient everybody there. So what we're seeing here is, again, our four megawatt array developed on the northern section of this parcel. We have a uh, cemetery, a portion of the cemetery that's existing on this parcel and another one off to the east that has access from Park Street. Now we will make direct access coming off of North Street. We'll have a, a new access road come in there and just move right down our property line there to the south. So that's also where we'd make interconnection to the distribution network that Eversource manages there. Projects like this one that are typically less than five megawatts in size all get interconnected to the distribution network. It's the larger, about 20 megawatt or so projects that have to think about interconnecting to transmission or directly to substations. So our project here is gonna interconnect at typical grid voltage um, and is again, fixed tilt, ground mount, um, PV, in, I'm sorry, uh, inverter-based solar production facility. So you can see here, if you're looking at the site plan, we have, um, again, our industrial abutters to the north, and we have identified one, two, and three residential abutters to the north of the array that are off of North Street. And then again, to the south, our next closest residential abutters come in about, about 1,000 to 1,400 feet away off of Stony Brook Road. And through our development process with our environmental assessments, we have our third-party engineers put together visibility assessments. They look at potential uh, view sheds before and after from a number of public access points on North Street uh, to the south and to the, to the uh, west off of Park Street. So with that said, that view shed analysis is in process right now. And it's our understanding and estimation that we're not going to have very many off-site views and especially if they're originating from the north. So we think with our development plan here, we're really gonna be able to blend in with the existing land use and really uh, co-locate together. You okay, Brad? I'll just, yes, I'll sorry. Okay, okay, so yeah. we're, we're just running through the site plan here if you okay. wanna, just kinda took us through some of our butters, some of our design here, and then if you wanna kinda walk us through the, the wetland feature that kind of creeps in and then primarily just stays in the, in the woods, that'd be great. Yeah. So uh, as Brian mentioned, we have a, do have a small wetland feature uh, located off to the east. Uh, the closest to the site is uh, it's approximately a little over 200 feet. I want to say it's about 230 feet uh, from the actual dis uh, proposed disturbance. And then that wetland feature obviously extends to the south and uh, through the wooded area of the site more towards uh, Stony Brook uh, Road there. Uh, and there is a small uh, potential vernal pool uh, located in the... Uh, in that piece of that wetland, uh, a little bit uh, in the middle of that southern area of the site. Uh, but the uh, critical terrestrial habitat associated with that wetland is uh, just touches the corner of the facility, but that is actually not necessarily optimal habitat uh, for those uh, potential vernal pool species. They end up staying in that forested habitat uh, as well. So. Okay. And did you touch about the distances? We did. Okay. Yeah, we ran through some of the distances. So I'm going to go ahead and um, move on to slide eight. And slide eight looks like this here. And a part of our development process is a pretty robust public outreach and public relations plan. So like I mentioned, we had intru introduced the project to uh, some of the town staff a couple months ago, had updates, and now we are here in front of the commission to provide the update of where we are and also to inform you of our development plan and next steps. So with that said, when it comes to reaching out to neighboring property owners, the community and our local municipality here, what we do is reach out to every property owner that touches or is across the street from the property. We have a little over two dozen here because it's such a large piece of land. We uh, put together a butter letters, fact sheets, and we have a project website that's live 24 seven. So if you were to go to vergy.com backslash Enfield Solar One, you'd come to the project website and you'd have a summary and access to the materials that we're pretty much talking about here today. There's also a contact form, which anybody can go to, submit a message, and it comes directly to our email inboxes. And we really use that as a tool to communicate with community members. So like I mentioned, we have uh, earlier this week delivered those butter letters and fact sheets out to all two dozen of those residents. So those were in the mail. Those will probably be landing in mailboxes yesterday or the day before. That's the introduction of the project. Here's our second step. Our third step will be getting in front of town council. And then as the process continues to move towards siting council, 
any and all outreach we get from those neighbors, we talk to them directly. We answer their questions, we answer their concerns, we'll work with them on specific items of the design itself. Oftentimes, uh, we will go out directly and talk with those landowners, we'll walk portions of the property, really get them familiar with what we are proposing so they have a good understanding of what's going on. Because oftentimes, when it comes to solar development here in Connecticut, we found that a lot of people are just unfamiliar with what's happening, so they need their questions <coughs> asked, and that's what we try to help them get answers to those questions. So that's really what the public outreach plan is designed to do, and we have just kicked that off in our in, our, in those steps right now. So moving on to slide nine here, that looks like this. Brad's gonna take us through kind of our environmental due diligence and research to date, and then we'll touch on our next steps and really just open it up for questions. Yeah, so with that, we talked a little bit about the wetlands uh, already. Uh, we've done a wetland uh, delineation has been completed. We don't have any direct impacts to that. Uh, we've reviewed the natural diversity database. Uh, there is a blue uh, spotted salamander. Uh, we've re received that final determination from CT Deep and are going to be imposing the measures uh, associated with that determination. Uh, we've obviously received a, uh, a no material impact letter uh, to Core Forest from CT Deep. Uh, as well as a no material impact to farmland soils uh, from the Connecticut Department of Agriculture. Uh, this project will, uh, as part of that letter from the Department of Agriculture, uh, we are going to be uh, including a dual use program with uh, sheep grazing on site. Um, so as part of our maintenance uh, for the uh, project itself, uh, sheep will graze inside the fence of the facility uh, for the uh, 20 year life uh, cycle. Uh, additionally, uh, some of the project site work here, uh, very minimal site work is needed uh, for construction. I believe you heard previously about some new requirements from CT Deep. The only reason we have to have a stormwater basin associated with this project is because of some of those requirements. Otherwise, it would function just as it does today uh, as a you know overland flow. It's very flat. I think the grades out there about half a percent. Um, so minor grading associated with that stormwater basin, uh, and then all, you know, any disturbed areas will be uh, vegetated uh, post construction. Um, as far as the construction and operations, obviously it's a very simple construction process. We'll go through uh, installing stormwater basins, uh, constructing the facility from there. Uh, we're going to interconnect out on um, North Street, um, and it'll be about a four to five month uh, construction period to, from start of construction through commissioning. And then uh, as we talked about post-construction site activity is very minimal uh, with the exception of the sheep grazing on site and the um, uh, farmer um, sheep herder coming to, to move that flock around. So that usually will be end up probably for this site will be cordoned off into four sections. So the sheep will actually be moved in different paddocks inside the uh, facility uh, as required per their, the grazing plan. So some of the, uh, you know, next steps, obviously we're here, uh, meeting with, uh, yourselves. Uh, we've, um, done our Connecticut state agency consultations. Uh, we intend to present to the town council, uh, next month, uh, ultimately then filing our petition with the Connecticut siting council. Uh, looking around June to submit our application to, uh, CT deep. Uh, for our stormwater permit. We anticipate a uh, October uh, approval from the Connecticut Siting Council and uh, CT Deep at that point in time will likely submit our uh, building and electrical permits to the town and then weather dependent start construction late this year, most likely you know early next year um, into those months. So, and that's pretty much our next steps and I think we can probably open it up to any questions. Oh, thank you. That was pretty informative. If, if I, I don't mind, I'd like to start if that's okay with everybody. Usually I don't do that, but uh, so you're going to actually hook right up to the actual, what I would call Endeavor, uh, Endeavor, Eversource line right on North Street. That's correct. Not, not going through any kind of special transform, just out of curiosity. Oh, no. So the, the, the panels will, will have inverters on site, so they take the, the the panels are DC power, right. so direct current. So the inverters will take that DC power, change it over to AC, alternating current power. That will then go into um, 
some switchgear components, ultimately to a, a transformer that takes that lower voltage AC power, transforms it up to the 13.8, so it'll be the same, actually 23 kV, because that's the voltage of the line for Eversource on the street, and that will then be uh, exported out to the street and tie into the three-phase lines that are on the, on the street, which will actually be extended up slightly from Park Street. And that's because they, that's because basically you, you have a smaller operation, a bigger operation would require a, a transfer station or something of that nature. Correct, correct. You wouldn't see the some type of a substation or anything other than the, I think it was mentioned previously, the project, the gravel pit solar project uh, in East Windsor that was recently approved. That's 100 megawatts. They actually have their own substation and are connecting to the high voltage transmission lines. Now, could you have gone, could you have gone bigger here, the size of the solar panels or is this kind of at the limit for this lot so this is at the limit for the program so the program we're participating in does have a four megawatt ac cap so we're right up to that cap with the project size. okay so it's not not that you could have you make it larger you're at the Correct. project limitation yeah. we 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 check the box for what's allowed per the program okay yeah. so that's why the, exactly okay. yeah. and just for a case i'm sure we all know some of us might not this basically is where the i want to say the driving range is now correct that's, that's correct, correct. Right. yes yeah. And, and one last question on the sheep. Um, I, mean, my, I, I love the idea. What a, what a great novel idea that is. But I'm just concerned about the, um, the babble. Um, how is that going to be controlled for the abutters? Just out of curiosity. You know, sheep can be, I'm not going to imitate them, but I think you're all, you all know what I'm trying to ask here. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we, we wouldn't ask you to <laughs> imitate the sheep, obviously. Yeah. So. With that said, we think our current design has enough setback from our fenced-in limits to those abutting property owners so that the, the noise of those babbling sheep should dissipate in time as it were to reach those okay. those receptors. Okay. Well, at least you've thought about it. We have. Yeah. yeah. We, we, so this isn't the first time that we've proposed this. We've, uh, we've developed six projects through the Connecticut Siting Council, and three of them had this component. So we really went through the ringer last year with the Siting Council, running through all their questions. We've worked to develop a sheep grazing plan with a company called Agrivoltaic Solutions. They're based in uh, Ithaca, New York. Um, as you can imagine, there's been a lot of solar like this deployed in Massachusetts and New York, and solar grazing really picked up steam there and is starting to make its way into Connecticut now. Yeah, well, thank, you. So. thank you. I'm all set. Commissioner DeGray? Uh, just thank have you. a couple of questions. You said you don't need water. Well, you've got animals there. You need water. Then um, waste cleanup from these animals because just east of that land, wind travels, so doesn't the smell. I work in Ellington. I know what that smells like. Um, shelter for these animals during the winter, or do they get removed and moved? I mean, it is New England. We do get cold, wet, snow. Absolutely. So. Yep. So to take it from the, the former there, the animals would be on site during the grow season only. So typically late April to uh, end of October in certain, grow in certain grow seasons. So when they're on site during that grow season, what our sheep grazing partners have really told us and even showed us pictures of is on a hot day, they'll shelter in the shade underneath the modules. So if you're thinking about it, you've got about a two and a half to a three foot leading edge and then probably eight, eight feet high on the other side. So you have a good bit of shade that's cast onto the inter row before you reach the next row. So there is a, sh a shade there that they take shelter from during the grow season when they are uh, on site. And as far as the water and any additional forage, that is br typically brought on site by the grazing partners. What they do is they'll have a livestock trailer or a water tank truck that they'll bring the water resources on site for the um, for the sheep to use for their water. And then for the, the sheep <clears throat> manure piece, because we addressed this with the siting council as well and water quality and all that, Brad. Yeah, and that's that's the uh, the process of the the paddocks and and the rotation through the through the site. So it is, you know, it allows for those areas to to reestablish vegetation for the manure waste to break down and uh, ultimately just absorb back in the soil as far as nutrients go. So it's a, you know, a process of moving them through the site to make sure that, you know, we're not overtaxing one portion of the site uh, versus another. So uh, I guess the waste stays on a site. Yeah, just like it would with any farm. 
yep. in that stand okay, standpoint. So that's, that's, yep. that's good to know, and it's good to highlight. Yep. Okay. Question, Mr. Chair? Yes. <clears throat> Did you say um, your stormwater was going to drain to the stormwater on North on North Street? No, no, sorry. No, the tie the, into North Street, I thought you said tie in the, the uh, stormwater. No, not the stormwater. The uh, the electrical distribution will tie into North Street. The stormwater will drain towards the wetlands as it does today. So the stormwater basin is off on the east side of the project. Right. And that it will catch the, over, the the water as it's flowing over land from west to east as it does today. And then it will just, <clears throat> we're taking it, we're doing our peak so, attenuation. That will then overflow and direct, get continue to the wetlands as it does today. I thought you had said catch basins were going to tie into North Street. No, no. Okay. Um, what kind of uh, maintenance equipment is required after post-construction going forward as far as uh, trucks and vehicle sizes? It's usually just a, uh, a pickup truck, utility truck. I mean, at that point in time, you may be replacing one or two broken panels at any given time or uh, replacing any uh, uh, equipment that may malfunction in the inverters themselves. And the inverters, the components are, okay, are so small. So no large tractor trailers, because there's no, some no. issues on that road with tractor trailers and it's posted, you've probably seen it. I don't think they're enforceable signs, but um, there is issues with tractor trailers uh, going up and down there. Yep. Yeah, correct. Post, post, post construction, construction, post construction activities, it's all light duty pickups that okay. go in, right. and really, from an electrical perspective, once a month tops. Uh, in, in the first couple months after, after we finish construction, there's there certain components that kind of fail and you get out the site, but in the latter years after that, it's really limited. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for being Tony. Yeah, when you when you guys do your public outreach, uh, well, somewhat facetiously, but are people more? Uh, uh, curious about the sheep or the solar panels, uh, but uh, but on a more serious note, I, somewhat facetiously, uh, what are, what is the most common concerns you hear during your public outreach from from abutters and just uh, just all your outreach? Yeah, great great question. So we really do spend a lot of time talking to neighbors and residents, and we get all the questions you could imagine, right? <laughs> and a lot of it has to do with uh, just being unaware of what the projects are, what they do. And we spend a lot of time kind of educating the keys are, again, there's no emissions produced by the project, right? They want to know, is it making noise? Is it going to shine lights in my house? I am I going to be able to hear anything? Am I going to be able to see anything crazy? Is it going to pollute the waste? Is it going to pollute the water, the groundwater, all of that? So we've pretty much heard it all. And when it comes down to it, the projects themselves are pretty straightforward. They're, there's really no moving parts with the fixed tilt projects. The panels themselves are glass encased in aluminum flame in a, an aluminum frame. We pass uh, what's known as a TCLP test, to TCLP test, I believe it is, toxicity leaching procedure test, right? So we pass all those tests for, for no hazardous waste, and that really helps us kind of get folks over the edge so that they understand what's going on with the project and um, what it would mean to them. Mr. Marginer. Yeah, I think the outreach program is wonderful idea. The sheep grazing is also a great idea. And keeping those low skilled golfers away so that they don't damage the pen, that's a good idea. <laughs> On a more serious note, 20 years from now, that's your lease at this point. Uh, my experience has been that the land reverts back to the owner and that the installer or whoever operator removes all the equipment at the end of 20 years as well as clean the site whichever way it needs to be. Is that what's part of the normal routine that that's what will happen? That is correct. Yes. So as you mentioned, at the end of our lease term, we are required and bound by our lease to remove all the equipment, pull all the racking and modules and, and, and conduits out of the ground, and it re reverts to the owner. Uh, in this case, the Catholic Cemeteries Association of the Archdiocese of Hartford is the landowner um, of this property. What happens is what we consider today as not objectionable sensitivity environmentally uh, tied components of the panel, yep. the cables, the concrete, the steel, whatever. 20 years later, somebody may say, oops, no, that steel was no good because it has whatever component of nickel in it, and that's all of a sudden hazardous. 
Does that mean you will clean up whatever those or such concerns that may arise 20 years later? So with that said, yeah, like I mentioned, we are bound by our lease agreement to remove all the equipment from the property. And, and you know, we haven't run into a situation like that yet, right? And to our knowledge, all the, to our knowledge, all the components we are installing, we have a good understanding of them, right? The steel racking, the components that are in the modules themselves, what the inverters are made up of. So we try to have a good understanding of what we're installing and what we'd ultimately have to remove as well. And in addition to that, I mean, we'll be bound by federal and state regulations as far as disposal of any hazardous materials. So if something were to change between now and then, it really wouldn't matter. We'd still be bound to dispose of them appropriately at that point in time. Right. It's unpredictable, variable, but thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great information. I think a lot of us just learned yeah. something new there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Commissioner Kulinski. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Petrano, were you first or? Oh, um, sorry. Uh, the question with the uh, with the uh, disposal now, they have about a 20 year life cycle to, yeah. to the panels. Is that basically what's happened? So, if when it gets decommissioned, mm -hmm. everything just gets dismantled and the, the panels are able to go to the dump. There's nothing hazardous, I guess, right? With these panels. No, 20 years later, what's going to be hazardous? That's true. The what's sheep are going to be glowing. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we certainly don't think so. Uh, but basically, <laughs> disposal is just taking them and where do they go to, to the dump? Do they so get recycled? Th they would get recycled. Would be the first, right? You'd pull off the aluminum frame. You have quite a bit of glass and then polysilicate wafers within. At this point in the the solar industry, it's we've had about 15 years or so of large scale developments. A lot of rooftop projects and ground mount projects have been developed. So we're starting to see those recycling companies pop up quite a bit and it's it's become quite a secondhand commodity market where there is a lot of use and demand for these panels from a recycling and even a even a, a re uh, like reapplying them in an, in a newer in an older project right so the panels themselves have a 35 year warranted production useful life meaning they'll still produce about 80 percent of their power 35 years down the road mm -hmm. so people are finding ways to get them on the secondhand market for significantly less and reapply those to a project elsewhere great thank you You're welcome Mr. yeah just out of curiosity over a 20-year period how many of the panels would need to be completely replaced or do you know really uh, uh, in our hope none uh, you know it just may be a you know who knows a freak accident you know the kid throwing a stone you know or something at the panels uh, flying golf balls right <laughs> um, you know but but they do have some electrical components in there so if, if any of those components fail and they're just not producing what they should be then that would be again they may not meet their warranty requirements so those would be replaced yeah. as well can you do partial repairs like replace you know parts parts of panels or is it you know, you not just, usually because they're fully encased yeah, it's, it's and encapsulated whole, yeah. at that point in time but we would just replace one so individual we'll panel panel yeah. so okay mm -hmm. all right thank you any other questions i mean at this point Tim, do you like, like the last gentleman who was here do you need a like a letter of support from us or similar to what Referral? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that would be the ideal outcome. Okay. And hopefully the the work here and the continued work would would warrant that type of response. Sure. Time. So that Is there any objection that we ask staff to do the same that we did with the last applicant? Mm -hmm. I don't there's think there's objections. any objections yes. here, um, Laurie. So could, could you please also uh, letter in support of this project? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Very, very, very much. informative. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Good luck with your time. Appreciate Good luck with the time. project. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Laurie. Yes, no, Absolutely. we can definitely do that. Yeah, Thank you. we'll be in touch with, with Laura. No, no, they're not. Thank you no. very much. Yeah. We are. So the website is up. And the, the website will be up. So oh, okay. One last, one last, way. I'm sorry, one last question for of you. Course. We can keep going here. And because you did mention that municipalities can buy in, which, which, Correct. Another, another thing I'm really in favor of. But yeah. at this point, as far as you know, Enfield municipality has not bought in. Correct. So, I think from from the perspective of the program, what in what we can do in working with um, Kasha and Ellen, because we've talked to them quite a bit, I would suggest, and I could email them and talk about them, just reaching out to the administrators of the SCEF program at Eversource, and just simply ask to be to be considered to opt in to a portion of the project. Great. It's certainly available. Great. And I, I would, if I can, I would recommend that when you go in front of the council, you you mention that part of it. Yeah, absolutely. I would highly recommend you do that. It really, it's your call. Yep. Absolutely. No. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Take care.
Okay, any correspondence? Um, I, I, I don't know if we're going to consider that correspondence or not, Lori. Um, we did receive from a uh, resident those list of questions. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. That's really not up for you guys to do. So. Okay. Okay, thank I mean, you. I, just, I will, if you like, I will hand you out the pa I packets. Don't, I don't want one because there's pending litigation. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I yep. mean, yeah, it's probably best. Yep. I don't want one. I think it's mixed, so you probably shouldn't receive it. Yep, thank you. But I will do my best to answer her questions. Okay. Um, commissioner's correspondence. I do have one. Th oh, I'm sorry. I, no, go ahead. I wish you have to see your hand up. Lord, just a follow up uh, my uh, request last week for the mall owners to come in. Sure. What? Mall owners to come in and give us an update? We're working on it. Okay. Okay. You didn't hear they, back they, from them? The mall owners are in New York. I'm sorry? They don't live here. They are in New York, and and we're we're working on some other things that, that they might be coming up for, but won't be for maybe a month or so. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to combine it. So they don't have any representatives here in, the to in town in an office, no? N not even close. So it'll be some time before we hear from them, you're saying? Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, I just, it's you know, not going to happen, you know, probably within the next month is most likely. Okay. So well, as long as we keep it at uh, under radar. I, 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 I know you want to talk with them and, and you know, we'll try to get them here, but I think that we need to make it convenient for them. Oh, no, no. I'm just you know, Make it multitask. I was just checking to see if they responded yeah. back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, well, I'll ask you in a month. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And one thing I want to add is I just want to bring everyone's attention that um, there is a lawsuit on the uh, 2535 Bacon. So for the new commissioners, this is pending litigation. Um, I know after we decided that case, of course, we were free to talk about with neighbors or people we ran into to explain, you know, because it was closed and was done. But now a suit has been filed. It's pending litigation. We can't comment. Again, you don't want to talk with any neighbors about it or to explain any of our decisions on that. From this point on, it's just like it was still out there as a public hearing, okay? Mm -hmm. Just want to remind everybody of that. Yeah, thanks for that info. I didn't know. Yeah, we should be very, very careful because it's a suit. Um, whether it gets withdrawn or not, we don't, we don't really know. Uh, any other communications? Nope. Director of Development Services report. Um, so as you know, uh, Ben Winter um, left. Uh, yesterday was his last day. We do have a potential very good candidate I'm interviewing tomorrow, so maybe I'll have some good news for you as far as staffing levels at the next meeting. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, the revolving door. Um, so please, if I can, please be cognizant of that over the next month. They are down a person in, in, in the staff. Yeah, and next week, um, both Georgie and Nicole will be out at Casio training, so I'll be down to Rick and I. So, okay, so. <laughs> so, if you really need something, you know, give me a call, but I promise you, you I don't won't really, just walk wait in. a week. I promise you I won't just walk in next week. I know it's so easy for me to do that, so I'm here all the time. That, that's not a problem, but I'll probably be in the planning department, so, right. uh, which is not a problem either. Um... Don't forget, I, you should have all received in your emails the POCD survey, yeah. Yeah. I hope. Um, please take that, because... Survey? Yeah, please take it. It's, it's, uh, yeah. There's another one, new one that came out uh, this week. This week? Yeah. 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 It was sent to every commissioner. Did you send it? No, Nicole did. I didn't see it. I'll, I'll, go back, I'll go back and check, because I don't remember seeing it. Is this okay. one... Oh, Different I don't have it from the me. last one. I, I you know, this is the last this is new. One. Oh, okay. This I is just new. I want to make sure because so. when I saw it, I'm like, yeah, I already did this. Yeah. Did no, no, no. So no, I mean, it was very brightly okay. colored, and there's a QR code on it, so you could either is take it. Is that the it. one that's on our web page? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I saw that. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. It's on the web page. It's on pretty much a web page for every commission, and. It's on the planning page. It's we're going to have it at the home show. Um, so please, for any resident who's watching this, still please take yes, the survey. Please take it. Go to the go to the planning website and take the survey. Please, please, please. This is your town, and we need your comments. Applications to be received. Yep. So, um, public hearing 3031 at 33 Palumba Drive for a multi-tenant pylon sign. Uh, public hearing 3032, 7 Angina Drive, which is a resubdivision, two lots. 
Public Hearing 3033, 95 High Street, which is a special permit for a special event for Cinco de Mayo. Oh, okay. Oh, I know. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> um, Public Hearing 3035, 37 Sandpiper Road, special use permit for an accessory apartment. And SPR 1886, 3, 312 Hazard Avenue for a physical therapy office. And SBR 1887, 54 Hazard Avenue, administrative approval for two electric charging stations at Stop and Shop. And public hearing 3024, which actually we got quite a while ago, but we've been waiting on, um, I think we needed the, to receive the letter of authorization and they haven't paid their fee yet, but I just wanted to put it out here. So, um, and that's to, um, it's a Delhi edition at a mobile station. And so it's an expansion of an existing use. So as you can see, our next meeting is uh, going to be heavy, heavy meeting. Thank you, Lori. I don't think any of those things are, are something that you're going to talk at great length about, but it's just numerous. It's quite numerous. So. Opportunities and unresolved uh, issues. I do have one thing I, I want to bring up in front of the commission. I'm looking for some consensus. Um, okay. Something that's come up with a plan of conservation development that caught my eye that was mentioned there that I really think, especially because we have a lot of new commissioners and some that are back again, um, I would like to propose that we have a joint informational meeting with the plan of agricultural and conservation. Only because I think that we just need to hear their concerns and hear some of the things that they're planning or they would like us to consider. I'm not saying we agree to anything. I'm not saying that. Um, but I just think it would be nice if we open up communication, heard them, what they had to say, what they're proposing, they're working on things. They've been actively involved in the plan of conservation development. And I feel we should we should we should have a I don't want to call it a working meeting whatever you want to call it informational meeting because again we're working on the plan of conservation and development and they are the agriculture conservation I'd like to get a consensus here from the majority of you that we do that sometime maybe between now and July fourth no big hurry we'll let staff kind of work on trying to find a, a, a date that works for all of us is that somewhat agreeable to everyone sure. yes could I also add maybe have a workshop with all of the land use boards too so that we all know our roles so we have a better understanding who does what especially with some of the new commissioners that don't understand what zba does what inlands and wetland does what we do with yeah yeah just so that 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 usually um so you're looking for training uh, just, he's looking for He's you know, just, just looking yeah, for something different. to be nice. And we might be able to no, represent no, no, to I'm the FOI one. I'm trying to just clarify. So, yeah. so, like, every other year we we offer everybody to go to the Connecticut um, uh, Bar Association. Right. and that's a great yeah, And training. that's exactly what that does. It explains what every land use commission has, what their purview is and the statutory requirements and whatnot. But and, it would also give us yeah. an opportunity to actually meet all of the other commissioners. Mm -hmm. so, I, I'm just. Let us look. We'll look into it. We'll look into it. We'll look that. into it. Yeah. Okay. But in the meantime, uh, right. I'm seeing is, consensus. We're, we're going to be having a lot of meetings with yeah. POCD and then the zoning regs. So. Yeah. <laughs> we'll look into it, Commissioner DeGray. Fine. And I see there's a consensus for Lori to attempt to try to set something up at the conservation. Um, yep. You know, anytime between now and July. No, no big hurry. I'm not, I'm not asking next okay. week. You know, whatever. Yep. In okay. your spare Thank time. Thank you. In your spare time. Because <laughs> you got nothing to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think. I think. That I don't do nothing all the time. <laughs> motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. By Commissioner okay. DeGray seconded by Commissioner Higley to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is over at uh, nine twenty-six. Thank you.